If you grew up without consistent love and safety and validation from your parents, you've probably already noticed how vulnerable you are to the idea of a great love, a great love that just shows up in your life. Like there's ordinary people who are actually in your life and maybe you're single, maybe you have a partner, but there's this other hypothetical relationship in your imagination and it's just legendary. It's beyond what other people normally experience. It's a perfect union kind of love. And you have a deep sense of what that feels like for you to be loved for who you really are, to be safe and to be certain that you are in the right place, in the right relationship, in the right life. And chances are you have someone in your mind who feels like they are that person for you. And chances are, they aren't actually with you. Now these are the perfect growing conditions for what we call limerence, which is a state of infatuation or obsession that people with CPTSD can be especially prone to. It can happen to anyone, but with trauma and neglect in childhood, it just seems to get a real foothold sometimes. So sometimes you're gonna get limerent feelings for someone you're acquainted with. Sometimes it's someone famous or imaginary. And sometimes it's someone who is actually in a relationship with you, but in a limited way that leaves a big empty space for that obsessive waiting, hoping, searching obsessively for clues and evidence that they love you that often goes with limerence. So I got a letter yesterday from someone I'll call Lisa. And she writes, Dear Anna, my first marriage was 32 years ago with my best friend ever, or at least I thought so. Mike and I were so connected in so many ways, I didn't expect that I was in love with him until I was. It took one and a half years for us to recognize that, become a couple, and get married. It was great, but then it wasn't. He was doing drugs and I had to make him leave, Lisa says. I was devastated and it seemed he was too. He was sobbing his brains out yet didn't want to go to rehab. He didn't want to do the work to keep us together. I came from a nightmare home with screaming, verbal abuse, physical abuse, mostly my mom and brother got the physical abuse. What I did was hard-hearted as everyone seemed to observe. Mike was the best thing that ever happened to me. I was so crushed, confused, and broken, but I recall saying to myself, I can't be like my mom and stay in an unhappy situation. So I did what I had to do, and we split. Got my pencil here, and I'm circling things I want to come back to when I go through this letter again, but let's just read through now. I remained in touch with Mike's parents, especially his mom. After our divorce, he was married two other times and divorced two more times. His mom used to fill me in here and there, but he was not our main topic. We were actual friends with other stuff to discuss. I never saw Mike after the divorce because he moved to another city and that was that. As soon as the internet became a thing, I searched for him on a regular basis, even though I was with a new boyfriend to whom I eventually got married. It took me five and a half years to agree to marry him, and when I did, it was because I needed his health insurance so I could return to school. My new husband and I did have fun through traveling, having lots of friends and a lot of socializing. Still, I searched and thought about Mike on a regular basis. I don't feel this was normal, but I could not stop myself, she says. After about 25 years, Mike's dad died. I asked his mom to please ask him if it was okay if I attended services. She said no need to ask, but I didn't want to feel intrusive. The day came, and at the service, Mike and I saw each other. We hugged and cried for what seemed like an hour. It was very emotional. His latest girlfriend was there, and we were introduced. It was all laughs and a great-to-see-you kind of vibe. He asked if we could be in touch on social media, and I agreed. We never talked after that, but would occasionally like each other's pet photos and little things like that. Very generic. But I was secretly thrilled to know this guy again, my first and biggest love. The funniest, smartest person I've ever known was back, even if it was just via social media. So two years later, Mike's mom died and he messaged me directly. And from that point, we became reconnected. 
talking and laughing, and he apologized profusely about drugs and ruining our marriage. He even had a tattoo of us on his arm. I was a bit freaked out by that, but loved it, of course. All of this communication led to meetups, and I'm skipping ahead a bit, she says, or this will go on forever. <laughs> the meetups led to a first kiss and then an affair. He was now engaged to the girl I had met, and I was still married. We both seemed to love every moment. Then he decided to get an advanced degree for a new career, and it all slowed down, but we still communicated almost daily. Just nothing about hooking up. It was mutual and equal. Then it wasn't. I could feel the pulling back on his end, but we continued on discussing school, jobs, sports, and always music, which was our biggest bond. It's now been two years since we've seen each other. I go to therapy and he goes to class. It's been almost three years that he's been engaged. She is loaded and his keeper, if you will. Even after many times of him saying it'll never end until one of us is dead, he's slipping away. I know it and he knows it. The problem is that I cannot stop thinking or obsessing over him. I know it's affecting everything in my life. Although my husband doesn't know, I'm sure he can tell part of me is gone. I watch every video out there, go to therapy, speak to certain friends that know the truth. Nothing stops me from thinking about him. I'm obsessed and I do not want to be. I will always love him because I loved him, but I'm never going to have him. Am I so bored in my marriage or am I traumatized once again by this ex-husband and due to my crappy childhood? I have always missed Mike and our fling just makes me miss him all over again. It's ridiculous and I feel ridiculous. I do not regret our time together, but I need to make my brain stop because he's stopping and I'm now trying to stop reaching out. I even sit on my hands so I do not message him. He calls occasionally and we still text, but I need to stop waiting and living just to hear from him and I can't. My therapist said it's because of my miserable childhood and not getting my needs met then. She says this is a trauma bond. She's right, you're right, but how do I make it stop? He can reach out, that's fine, but I need to stop living for it. He doesn't want me back. In the beginning, I was the one in control and he wanted to know where I was and why he hadn't heard from me every five seconds, but that quickly turned and now, alas, here I am, lonely and longing for any bit of attention from him. Please help if you can, from Lisa. Oh, Lisa, I'm so sorry. This is one of the most painful things in life. And right now, the options that you're facing are all painful, but I'm gonna help you find the right way through, okay? <sighs> I circled a bunch of things on your letter here that I wanted to come back to. All right, so I, I believe you're in your 50s now. So your first marriage was 32 years ago, and Mike had been your best friend ever, and then you fell in love, and you were married, and it was really great at first, but then it wasn't. And the only thing you say about what was great then was, it was great, but then it wasn't. That's a really short statement. Okay, and the reason was because he was doing drugs, and you didn't really say whether he had been using drugs the whole time and you just realized it, or he got into drugs, or what happened there, but I know firsthand how devastating it is to love somebody who turns out to be using drugs, and that it is an impossible situation and he didn't want to go to rehab, and he didn't want to do the work to keep you together. Okay, so clue number one about Mike is not just that he was an addict and ruined your marriage, but he, he didn't want to do the work to keep you together. All right, and this shows up again later, so here we go. All right, and then you explain and my heart goes out to you. You come from a nightmare home with screaming, verbal abuse, physical abuse, and mostly your mom and brother got the abuse. Uh, that was how it was in my family too. What I did, you say, was hard-hearted, as everyone seemed to observe. Hold on a second there. I actually think leaving somebody who's addicted to drugs and not willing to stop is not hard-hearted. It's common sense. It's common sense. You don't give a lot of details about this, but when I hear the whole story here of what happened, and um, I, I'm just gonna take your word for it, he was an addict. And there is 
no happy relationship to be had with somebody who cannot stop using and some people who are using can stop and they can heal and it takes time but he wasn't doing that so i really think you did the right thing by getting out then right but i can also see what it says to me that you feel like you were too harsh and um, i think that what got stuck in your mind is that you did it prematurely that you know maybe you shouldn't have that it was this great love it ended up being so hard to find anything and i believe that you guys loved each other i get it so then you say mike was the best thing that ever happened to you okay well okay i'm just going to say accept that he turned out to be an addict and wasn't willing to do the work to be with you and so you know i know that later you married somebody who does do the work to be with you so i'm just going to sort of challenge that idea that this this like wild child guy that you were with was the best thing that ever happened to you what i what i'm hearing and i totally understand is that this relationship awakened a part of you that you don't ordinarily have access to and that's a beautiful thing and yet i i suspect in people like you and like me what that is is it's a it's a trauma memory and it's a it's a it's the satisfaction of a trauma wound with a fantasy and as people with childhood ptsd we sometimes have a really hard time telling the difference between what is a great love and incredible compatibility and what is something that has all the painful knife wounds of what happened to us as kids when it was terrible and people could not do the work to honor us and treat us caringly lovingly in the way that we deserved all right you got that as a kid you got that in your marriage so i really question that it was the best thing that ever happened to you i at least know that something much better can happen for you okay <laughs> and you say i was so crushed confused and broken but i recall saying to myself i can't be like my mom and stay in an unhappy situation so i did what i had to do and we split now i don't know if you noticed that but you've done exactly what your mom has done. You are staying in an unhappy situation in this limbo. And we're gonna talk about, what, about your marriage um, in a minute, but I don't mean just instantly that that's the bad thing. Your limbo is a living hell. You're suffering and suffering every day, and you have been for a long time, okay? So um, you know I'm the tough love fairy, and I think on some level you kind of knew what I was going to say when you wrote, but if you don't know, I'm going to tell it to you with great love and great understanding and relatedness, because I've been through this too. So then you say, I remained in touch with Mike's parents, and since you had been married to Mike, that's not crazy, especially his mom. And then he got married twice and divorced twice, so he had had three marriages. By the time you ran into him, he's got a fiancé for a fourth marriage, and you know, hey, people with CPTSD, that's often what it looks like. So no judgment, but just saying he does have, in the way that he has relationships, he has this pattern of, you know, going in and going out, going in and going out. It's not working out. And that would be also extremely consistent with somebody who is an addict and very charismatic. All right. Some people are addicts and nobody would marry them because uh, the drugs just blatantly make them awful to be around, but he's a charismatic addict. That's how I would describe it from the little you're saying. So his mom would fill you in here and there, but it wasn't your main topic. You had an authentic relationship with her. And you know, after the way you grew up, I totally understand holding on to the family that you once had when you were with Mike. All right. So you never saw him after the divorce because he moved to another city and that was that. And good, good. There were 25 whole years between getting divorced and bumping into him again, and that's good boundaries. Um, but as soon as the internet became a thing, oh, wasn't that a crazy couple of years <laughs> for those of us who get limerent, right? As soon as the internet became a thing, I searched for him on a regular basis, even though I was with a new boyfriend to whom I eventually got married. And so you searched for him even though you were with a new boyfriend. It took five point five and a half years to agree to marry this guy, and when you did, it was because you needed his health insurance so that you could return to school. Okay, so I think what you're trying to tell me is, but I never really loved this guy. But what you're accidentally telling me is something quite terrible, all right? You're exploiting somebody. But here's the thing. If you're going to be happy, Lisa, you cannot live in such a way that deeply deceives and hurts and uses other people. 
it just won't fly it doesn't work that way you can call it karma or you can call it inner peace but you cannot have peace and you will not find love you now I'm not rendering judgment on this marriage we're going to talk about that in a minute but the fact that you're trying to tell me oh I just went into it for health insurance that's that's just so morally wrong and so going into it just for health insurance is sort of saying I'm going to do something that looks like this conventional thing that people do called marriage but I'm not really doing it it's a material reason for so that I can go to school and if you grew up with trauma I bet you your youth was extremely complicated you didn't get that education really or you couldn't be present for it or you couldn't stay regulated enough to keep up with studies and move your career forward and also the whole thing about money like so many of us get financially hurt because of our trauma and because the families that we came from are so troubled like there's there is no money and that's I mean that's how I, I grew up I got a little bit of money when my dad died when I was a teenager it was it helped a little bit but you know I was on financial aid for a little bit I got social security benefits because my dad had died um, while I was a minor you know I scraped together and it took me a long time to finish college because I had to work and you know I know what it is to have to like scratch your way through survival and how um, relationships play a role in that and I, and and so I, I'm not standing here above you you know I had relationships that I just needed so I had somewhere to live I can see now how much <laughs> what, what a soul-sucking thing that was for all concerned that I hurt other people that I couldn't be happy that I was never free that when I did meet really great men I had weird stuff complications going on in my life that made me not seem like an ideal match to them and they weren't really interested so okay so then you say your new husband and you did have fun through traveling you had lots of friends you socialize a lot and you still searched and thought about Mike on a regular basis and you didn't feel this was normal but you couldn't stop yourself so uh-huh yeah that's you know that's when you have limerent tendencies that's what you're going to do somebody comes along and the idea that you know you had this miserable existence before that was so terrible that you had to rip yourself out of a marriage to get out of it but now it's going to be better and that idea comes in and that is what we do that's how trauma distorts our thinking and when it gets control over our lives it takes us right off the tracks so I'm here I'm your tough love fairy I'm just calling it for what it is you got limerent you know that's a like a infatuation and obsession on somebody you don't you're not actually with like if you were actually with him the same old problems would manifest and you it's interesting in your whole letter, letter you never say whether he stopped using drugs maybe he did and maybe he didn't but if that's not like a hugely significant fact about him whether he's using or not he's still in that addictive behavior that's I mean that's yes that he's having an affair he he gets into an affair right after he gets engaged like who does that right who does that is somebody who has just as much fear and avoidance as you have some people do avoidance by you know they just don't get into relationships but some of us have this subtler way where we want the simulation of a relationship or a marriage but we don't give ourselves to it and limerence really comes in as a way to sort of like take this huge piece of our heart and our love and our, our like the thing that we have to give to another person if it were to be for real we, we were like here I'm gonna I'm gonna direct that over here and then with this person I'm gonna have this limited thing and some people will criticize it and say oh it's a strategy so that you don't get hurt I don't think it's conscious it's not my experience that it's anything conscious it's uh, you know it's just like I can't help feeling like I need to eat food every day I can't help feeling like I need to breathe every day and there's a lot of behaviors that we can't help they come so naturally to us because they're just wired in there but while we do have to breathe and eat every day we actually can change these behaviors we can uh, work on that brain level we can work on the cultural level the social level we can heal these CPTSD symptoms so take heart all right there is a way out of this there's a way out of this hell and into peace and happiness for you and something that feels good and just like organically good for your life all right it's here for you and so I'm going to go through the letter and find it okay I mean I know where I'm going with this okay so then Mike's dad died 
and um, he contacted you directly, or no, the mom contacted you, and you came and you saw him and you got into the affair. So yes, we started talking about the affair. You were thrilled to know him. So what's interesting is when you first saw him, he was with a girlfriend and everything was like, hey, great to see you, we're friends, we're introduced. So right away, everybody goes into a fake persona, or at least you do. I can't really speak for the other two. Uh, surely this girlfriend has been jealous and f upset about you. I mean, unless she's completely high all the time and doesn't feel anything, she's noticing there's something going on, right? So you see him and you're thrilled, but everybody pretends, oh yes, we're just friends, you know, we used to be married, hi, how's it going? And then he says, can we stay in touch? And yeah, you know, that's not like crazy to stay in touch after 25 years. It seems like everybody can be friends. But the energy, the electric energy that you were feeling, probably he was too, and especially because he's an addict, that's my experience, that these things, like sometimes we're just tripping in our own mind, but sometimes both people feel them. And the fact that he entered into an affair with you means he was feeling it. So I don't doubt there was a real love between you and a real connection and that even 25 years, like you could feel it right away. But, Oh, why is life like this? Sometimes the great love you feel is not compatible with daily life. And there it is, you know, it's just, it's this great, you know, thing that brings you out of yourself and helps you experience the eternal and feel connected with it and no union with another person, except life with that person sucks. It just, it can't be done. They won't do it. They can't do it. They have an addiction. They're with somebody else. And you know, he was only engaged, and I know you thought about this, Lisa, you didn't write about it, but he was only engaged. He could have broken that engagement, and he chose not to. Um, so that was your clue. And it sounds like you were like, well, my, my marriage, you know, I, I never was really feeling it, and I feel this, and maybe I can have both things. All right, you're certainly not the first person to give that a try. And, but just like everybody who's given it a try, you got into a place of great pain and um, so another thing I wanted to say w that was significant, you know, I noticed that you had a, like a lack of empathy for your husband. I noticed you have a lack of empathy for Mike's now fiance, that you have a lack of empathy for her. I just didn't hear you say anything acknowledging what she was going through. And so, you know, you may have seen my video about how complex PTSD can give us narcissistic traits. And that's what happens. The need for love is so voracious and so consuming that it drowns out empathy for other people, ordinary empathy. And I think intellectually, you must realize that this woman is something terrible has been done to her by you and by Mike, and it's still being done by you guys because he's still in touch with you and you're still, you know, wanting him and hoping he'll leave. And, and what about her? So again, you know, I, I, I've been in your shoes, but it see, when you're in the middle of limerence, it, it is, it's another sort of weird kind of brain state where you, you, cannot, you can't perceive the full spectrum of reality. And I'm just here outside your limerence, just going, oh yeah, this is terrible. You're a good person, but you're doing a bad person thing that's really inconsiderate towards two people who are being robbed of um, something that they've been promised and that they showed up for in good faith, right? And that is just morally devastating. And there's, I, there's just no way to really live your life that way and be happy. So I want you to take hope. It's like, there it is. And you know, it's funny, like you've been in therapy all, this, all these years and your, your therapist is talking to you about it. Your friends are talking to you about it. And you know, you say you're watching videos, but none of those things are doing anything about it. And I don't know if people are calling you out on the fact that you're not taking action on this. What I hear you doing is you're waiting for him to decide if he's going to like, you know, call you or give you a little bit of that, you know, intense love that you are craving now. It is like an addiction, isn't it? It is. And it's, it's the stuff that what it does to your life is just like what drugs do to a person's life. So I just keep going back. Like you could not stay in an unhappy situation. So you did what you had to do and you split. And, um, and that's where you are right now. That's where we're going. So first we're going to deal with the matter of Mike. Okay. It's been two years since you've seen each other. You're going to therapy. He goes to class. Um, He's still engaged. He still hasn't gotten married. And I'm not surprised. And, um, oh, I feel for that girlfriend. 
that fiance that he's having an affair on the whole time. You're very logical, you're very reasonable. You're, I can tell you're a good person, but this one little bitter line comes out about, about Mike's fiance. She's loaded, meaning she has a lot of money, and she's his keeper, if you will. So that sounds like um, some envy that she has money and you don't, and that's why he's with her. Uh, and you might be right. You might be right. <laughs> If it's any satisfaction, I, it's, I don't think it's going to work out between them, given the way that he's treated her. And um, it sounds also exploitative. So he, you, you project that he's with somebody because he just wants the money. But just calling you out here, does that, mimic, does that echo a little bit how you're with somebody also because you want the financial security? So we've got two people here who had a great love, but they were not spiritually ready for it. And when I use the word ready, I'm not trying to give you hope because I think that um, this situation has been burned out too hard to call it back. A really good relationship can only take so much. <laughs> and uh, it will take, it has certain like rubber band qualities, a really good durable relationship like real love. It has rubber band qualities in that, you know, there can be hurts and it can come back, it comes back to its shape. But the, the stuff that you two have been through is so great and because um, years went on with this like lying and hurting other people, my take on it is this is too damaged. It's, there, it's, it's not only because he won't come back to you. It's because the good thing has been tainted by the toxic stuff. And it's so sad. But that can really happen. And that's why love is so precious. That's why caring for other people is something we strive so hard to learn how to do as people with CPTSD, because our, our traumatized behavior does spoil good and precious love, and that happens. But it doesn't have to anymore. You can make today the day that you don't do that anymore. Today can be the day that you clear it up. So you say you can't stop thinking or obsessing about him. It's affecting everything. Your husband doesn't know. I keep saying, we're going to come back to your husband. He's very important in this. Um, he can tell a part of you is gone. And um, yeah, I, I called this out before. You watch every video, you go to therapy, you speak to certain friends that know the truth. So I guess you had the idea that if you just kept talking about your feelings about him, that it would change. I used to think that too when I was in a situation that was a little like this. And um, I thought if I talked and talked and talked, um, I would pop out of it. But that's not what happened. You know what happened? It got worse and worse and worse. And it, it took on properties that were nothing like love. It was more like depression, self-attack, not wanting to live. It was terrible. And so you know what the day that changed it for me was? Is my friend who showed me the daily practice that I teach everybody. Every I mention it in every video. It's always down in the description section if you want to try it. But this is a technique. What I really needed was not to be obsessed on something that wasn't there. What I really needed was a way to find comfort and meaning and rest and clarity. That's what I really needed. And by a stroke of amazing good fortune, I met somebody who showed me these techniques where I could just get these horrible thoughts and feelings out of my head, onto paper, and then rest my mind. And it's two specific techniques. It's easy, it's free, you can learn it too. But that's what happened. And my friend taught me this. And then I said, I'm still really troubled about this relationship, you know, so obsessed and can't let go. She was just like, oh, having any kind of contact that has romantic intent with a married person is wrong. And if you want to get happy now, cut it off. That simple, okay? And I literally, Nobody had ever told me that, who I'd gone to for help. Now, everyone knows that, but I was being very selective, I think, about where I would go. And so I was going to this therapist, and we were drawing pictures about it and talking about dreams and, you know, why was I sad and what was the last interaction like? And, you know, this is a long time ago. But she, she had never said, and I guess I had really carefully picked friends who wouldn't challenge me, who would just say, cut it off. And that when she said it to me, at first it struck me like somebody just took a sword and stuck it through my heart. And then I just realized, of course, that's it. And I did it. I cried for about 45 minutes. And then I felt so good. I felt free. Of course, that's what it is. You cut off contact with these people.
So you'll hear me say this, we've been talking about limerence in other videos and you know, people who get stuck and their whole, you know, your whole life, it's like pouring cement on the engine of your life to get stuck in something like this. It's, it's so just life destroying and there's a solution. And the first thing you do is you stop pouring cement on it. You stop having contact. So sometimes you need a friend like me to just get in there and say, let's look at it. Were you happy? No. When you were with him, you were miserable. You know, was he available to you? No. The, one of the hallmark signs of a relationship that's good and right for you is that that person can be with you and will be with you. And if they cannot or will not be with you, they are not the love of your life. They are not. They might be an ex-love, but they are not for you. And there it is. And I say that like in the, my really stern teacher voice because it just needs to get through. It needs to get through the fantasy of like, because when you are a kid and you're dealing with the abuse and the horrible stuff that you went through, it's so easy to think, right? It's like, yeah, you know, dad's hitting mom and my brother all the time, but, but actually everything's okay. And then you go to school and everybody's like, well, how are you, Lisa? And you're like, I'm fine, and, <laughs> right? You get so good at that. I call it crap fit. You probably know that if you watch my videos, you fit yourself to crap. And you've been doing that all along. You've been fitting yourself to crap and you've been trying to survive. You've been using crap fit to get by in the world. And so one little thing I want to put out there for you is if financial insecurity is a thing for you, whatever you do about your marriage, I really encourage you to get out there and get a way to make money and to have health insurance. So you never again, have to set up some fake relationship that you're miserable in so that you can have health insurance. I know how hard it is. It's crazy expensive, but it would be better to go on public assistance and get that kind of insurance, which is not ideal. I know. And a lot of hassle and paperwork, it's not ideal, but it's still, you still get to be a free person and not exploiting anybody else for your security, not deceiving anybody else. Oh, you, oh yeah, your therapist says this is because of your childhood. It's like, yeah, but I just wanna, yeah, obviously. Your childhood, everything that's happening here is, is what we do. It's what happens to people with CPTSD. So I agree that it's because of that, but I don't know what came after that. You say you don't know how to make it stop. So since your therapist didn't tell you, here's what you do. You're not gonna see Mike again, all right? If you wanna use what, my technique here, don't see him again. You send him. Uh, a text if that's the safe way that you can communicate without harming any ever again his fiance. Now whether they work it out or not that's no longer your concern but you're not going to get in there to apologize, you're not going to try to explain anything and you're not going to try to get closure. Closure is a fake word, it means opening really when, you, when you're addicted to somebody. So you go in there, so you send a text and say I've thought about it and I've realized that for my own mental health I need to not have contact with you. This is goodbye and I wish you the best. That's all you have to say. You don't even have to say I wish you the best, but go ahead, you know, just send that goodwill. And then what you do is you block, you block text calls, social media. If you ha and you can, social media lets you block people. As a person on YouTube, I know all about it. When people get yucky, I can block them. So you can block people. And if you have to change your number, change your number. You know, since he shows signs of being somebody who's in active addiction, either with substances and or in, in relationships, um, getting cut off by you could trigger a fake, you know, that this like reaction of like, oh, gimme, 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 and he might try to make contact with you. So for you to be strong for that, I'm just telling you, he may do that again, but it's gonna be the same fake kind of interest in you that doesn't involve saying, I've realized I love you, I totally stopped using drugs, I got my life together, and I only wanna be with you right now if you're willing to leave your marriage. Like if he, if he didn't say that, and if, if he, anything he says now to try to keep the little dopamine thread going with you, because that's what it is, right? Life feels empty, and, and you can always like send a little text and get that little, <gasps> he calls and he's getting the same thing from it. And he makes contact when he needs a little lift, when he's feeling empty. All right, if a, when a person loves you, they don't put you through this. This is such a hard video, isn't it, Lisa? And, um, but 
I, I just want to be straight with you. It's not love when somebody does this to you, keeps you on a string and does not show up to be in your life and, and, and give you love. So you can have love. You can have it. And this brings us to the question of your husband. So you're in a marriage that what you're saying is not really a real marriage, that you got into it for financial reasons and that you have friends together and you've had travel and it's fun, but you're not really feeling it. It may be that you got married under false pretenses and the right thing to do for his sake. And we really have to consider what's best for him because getting married is making a promise to somebody. And sometimes we have to break that promise, but this, this requires careful thought. Whether you think that if you could detox from this addictive relationship you've been in, if you, if you would like to give that some time to see if your feelings can blossom for your husband, I would totally back you on that, but it has to be a really clean thing. Um, and, and whether you do that or whether you immediately exit the marriage, um, I'm really encouraging you to have, to possibly change your therapist. I think you, I think therapy is a great idea, but if you haven't been, if you had therapy for two years and you don't know how to make these things stop, which is just a tactical set of actions, if you don't know, um, I think you may want to get a therapist who's a little more experienced with love addiction and who can help you draw your boundaries and hold them and talk more about the boundaries and not the feelings that make you want to cross the boundaries. The feelings are going to be there. It'd be like if somebody were addicted to drugs and just wanted to go talk about the drugs all the time and how it felt to be high and how much you miss them rather than, okay, what are you going to do to stay clean today, right? What are you going to do to stay away from the people who you know are going to be tempting to you? Let's make a plan. So those are the people you need, um, friends too. So friends who really support that. One thing you can do, um, I have a dating course and uh, this, you know, I feel like this is not the time for you to go dating, but what I wanna call your attention to is that I start everybody out with writing down what they really want. What do they really want? And so you can start now writing that down and as you detox and as your mind clears, you can keep updating that and to get clearer what you really want. But under no circumstances, I just know you don't, you don't want some guy who's like engaged to somebody else. Like, why would you want that, right? That's not what you want. So you can begin to just lay out there, there is something you want and that can kind of help you endure the withdrawal that's gonna come. It is withdrawal as you let go, as you let go for good and make no more contact with this guy who's been life sucking for you. You were doing okay, and then this came, and so now there's still time for your life to be happy. There's time for you to have a wonderful relationship. So your husband is stuck by you. Um, somehow he doesn't know. That's a little odd because it seems like it might, you know, anybody sensitive might know, but maybe you've been very good at hiding it. But I think that a, a therapist and friends could help support you over time to make a decision um, within 90 days if you're going to try to make it work with your husband or not. And he certainly deserves a chance as a person, but if, if you're not feeling it, then the most loving and honorable thing to do is to uh, end it, is to end that relationship. And I thought a lot about this question of whether you tell him what's been going on. That's a hard one. A lot of people are just like an automatic yes, tell, always, you, you know, honesty. You can't have a good relationship without honesty. And so that's, that's one that needs to be worked out with you and people you trust who know the details of the situation with you and your husband. But I will just say that if you do decide to be honest, it needs to be entirely limited to what needs to be said for him to understand the situation that you have not been fully in the marriage and either yes, you wanna work it out with him or no, you're ending the marriage, that it needs to be clear and not drag him into a chaotic, confusing, you know, heart-wrenching thing. So for that, that's why I say, I, I really encourage you to do this with a strong therapist or perhaps consider going to a 12-step program for love addiction and getting the best sponsor in the room. You know, go to enough meetings, notice the woman who's really kick-ass and ask her to sponsor you and to help you do this cleanly. The thing about CPTSD and especially um, limerent thinking is we, we can't think clearly for ourselves. We have to bring other people into the decision process. You can too, okay? You can do that. The other thing I'm gonna recommend, whatever you decide to do or how to handle this, is try out my daily practice. 
you need a place to to self comfort there needs to be a way to do that without resorting to texting him thinking about him uh, talking about him and did I mention that don't just not have contact with him don't think about him don't talk about him and I know some thoughts are involuntary they'll come up in dreams but you can do this if you catch you have to like start training yourself if you catch yourself thinking about him have a go-to happy thought that you have instead all right and if you catch yourself talking about him just pull back and with your friends just say I'm trying not to talk about him I think this is an extremely underrated technique for getting somebody out of your mind don't think about them don't talk about them and uh, so sometimes our friends and even therapists can enable us in continuing to stay obsessed by letting us talk about it and as if that's going to lead to some breakthrough if it hasn't led to a breakthrough by now I mean talking about it is necessary up to a point but if you haven't had a breakthrough yet I don't think it's going there I don't think that's going there um, what I see here is you need peace you need a nice clean slate sort of like somebody who walks into a river river and bathes themselves and comes out on the other side and wraps themselves in a white robe and just being safe and um, putting down and cleansing away all this stuff you've been doing to try to find love that's hurting you and hurting other people and you'll find that when you're making a good and noble endeavor like this the right people to help you will show up and sometimes you'll just find that the wind is under your wings you get help you get help to get through the hard nights there's going to be a lot of tears a lot of feelings because that's what addictions do is they're helping us handle and suppress this well of pain we've got and the interesting thing about pain is it's just sadness it's grief it's some anger and if especially if you have a comforting technique like the daily practice that I teach it can just kind of come up and you cry and you feel mad and it just like rolls through you and it's a it's just a wave that passes and then you have a quiet period where you can do the laundry get a job you know do the dishes call your friend get your nails done you know whatever it is that's just daily life for you right so that's how it's done you asked how do I make it stop and that is how how do I set boundaries so that a relationship can turn out into the loving committed relationship that I'm craving and not the temporary disappointing experience that I keep having have you had this problem so today I'm reading a letter from someone I'll call Connie and she says dear fairy I'm confused I've been seeing a guy we started out as friends we talked a lot and I really like being around him I knew he was fresh out of a relationship for three months and still living with his ex obviously not ideal says Connie after a while things got sexual and I did tell him about my no casual sex rule as I don't feel comfortable in investing in someone where there's no future I asked him before we got intimate you told me you wanted to be alone for a while I need to know if there's an option for dating before we do this because I could develop feelings and get hurt if it's one-sided he responded with I have feelings for you now and we can do everything but I don't want to ruin what we have now so we had sex a few times and then after a week we had a conversation and it came up that he wanted to be alone but have it all so he wants to keep seeing me like what you're doing now but nothing more and I got really sad and then really furious and I went into a little rage against him I'm not proud of which I can only describe as the abandonment melange that you and Pete Walker talk about the thing is I feel like the no casual sex boundary I put up scares away guys before they can develop feelings he even told me you're like my ex she is also afraid to get hurt you need to trust someone a hundred percent and if something happens that you don't like then that's when you take the trust back I feel like there's some merit to this but I can't see clearly how I do this in real life how to trust and just let things play out and have boundaries to protect myself I don't think he said this to manipulate me or anything I think generally he's a good guy just with poor communication skills I'm conflicted because men value their freedom and they need trust but I need commitment and I don't want this to keep happening because it's gone this way so many times I tend to meet guys who are done with me after sex or fake their whole personality to get me into bed and then when they conquered me they are done and it makes me feel like an empty shell of a woman and I don't want to respond to this with using sex as a bargaining chip 
I think that's how my boundary gets interpreted. It's situations like this that make me even more needy and that just don't help any relationship to flourish. So my question is, how can I go around relaxing around guys and exploring the connection without being so hyper-focused on the end result while keeping my boundaries and being true to myself? With kind regards, Connie. Oh, my darling, Connie. I feel for you so much. This is a very, very painful place, and I think I can give you some help today. I'm going to go back over your letter, and this is going to be tough love, all right? This is going to be tough love, and it's not because I want to give you a hard time. It's because I want to help you unpack, like, what's happening here. I want to help you see what, what's happening and how, how the person setting you up for this problem is actually you. And that's good news because if it's you, then you can change how you do this. All right, so let's go over the letter again, line by line. You start out, I'm confused, all right, yes. I've been seeing a guy, we started out as friends, we talked a lot and I really like being around him. All right, so far so good. I knew he was fresh out of a relationship for three months and still living with his ex. So tough love point number one for you, Connie, is if a guy is still living with his ex, he's not out of the relationship. He's not out of the relationship. So if you're going to change your life and you're going to reserve your heart for a committed relationship, one type of person that doesn't get on the list of people you hang out with romantically are guys who live with their girlfriend or ex, all right? They need to be emotionally available. And when he's emotionally available, one sign you'll have, just one sign, this is not the end all be all, but he will not live with another woman who he's ever slept with, okay? So that's thing one. <laughs> All right, so you acknowledge that he lives with this ex is obviously not ideal. After a while, things got sexual, and I did tell him about my no casual sex rule, as I don't feel comfortable in investing in someone where there is no future. Okay, my next piece of tough love for you, Connie, is that you don't have a no casual sex rule. You had casual sex. So whatever you may want or say, your actions communicate that you're okay with casual sex. There's no rule there, all right? So you describe this as a rule, but it's really like a preference or a desire, all right? That's what I would say. So you don't feel comfortable in investing in someone where there's no future. And, you know, I'm just going to encourage you to be more specific about it's like discomfort that's like when you go to the dentist and they pull a tooth and they say oh this is this is going to be uncomfortable no it's going to hurt a lot and so it's not that you're uncomfortable with it it's i'm just going to speak for you here you're devastated when sex doesn't turn into a relationship that's not what you wanted right so then you say i asked him before we got intimate you told me you wanted to be alone for a while. I need to know if there's an option for dating before we do this because I would develop feelings and get hurt if it's one-sided. All right, so this is where I'm really hearing the childhood trauma like complicate your ability to ask or, or set a boundary here. So you say, you asked before you got intimate. You told me you wanted to be alone for a while. All right, when a guy says he wants to be alone, what that means is he doesn't want a relationship. It doesn't matter if he says for a while. A lot of times when people say, put something in temporary terms like, I don't want a relationship right now, they're trying to be kind. They don't want to say, I don't want a relationship at all, or they don't want one with you. And I know that's harsh, but it's really important if you want a committed relationship to just sort of take a statement like that. When you ask somebody about their availability and they say they don't want a relationship, just take it at face value. Don't put hope in that for a while. And so then what happened is, I need to know if there is an option for dating before we do this. So you're asking, like, might he, if, is there an option? That means, like, it's possible that he would want to date you. And what's a little strange to me is that you're sleeping with him, but you're talking about, like, you're not considering it dating. And if you want a committed relationship, the first thing you do is date. You don't sleep together and then date. And I know that we all know people where that ended up working out for them, but if you have childhood PTSD and you get devastated by casual sex, I'm just saying casual sex by definition is sex without even going on a date, like not even going to dinner. Not, not only are you not committed, but you're not even dating. So you said, I need to know that there is an option for dating before we do this because I could develop feelings and get hurt if it's one-sided. So 
I know how human beings are. Sex is bonding. Once you have sex with somebody, if you're going to have feelings for them, they're going strong right then. And this bond has been formed. But even if he said, yes, I guarantee I'm going to want to date you in the future right now, this is just sex. Even if he said that, your bond would kick in and, you're, and, and that part of you that feels devastated is not going to like that. And I'm going to talk to you in this video about what it could be like if the next time that you ever have sex is in a relationship with somebody you know is really into you and wants to be with you, you can reserve yourself for that situation and I'll tell you how in a minute. Okay, so he said, I have feelings for you now and we can do everything, but I don't want to ruin what we have now. That's really interesting because what you heard, you said we, you had sex after that with him. So what you heard is that he somehow went along with what you were saying, I need to know. He says, I have feelings for you now, but <laughs> right before you have sex with somebody, of course they have feelings for you, right? It's sexual feelings. It doesn't necessarily mean he didn't even say like, I want to date you. And he also said, I don't want to ruin what we have now. So let's look at this critically. If setting the parameters that you would need to even be dating somebody to sleep with them is going to ruin what you have now, what does that mean about what you have right now? If it gets ruined by any kind of like we're dating statement, it's not dating. Okay. So you expressed a preference and you felt like it was going to be a boundary, but it wasn't. And so he, it doesn't sound like he, you know, pressured you from what you're saying. You sort of said, this is my boundary. And he said, oh, well, I, you know, I feel something for you now and we can do this. And, you know, we don't want to ruin it. This is a little bit of a cliche in disappointing experiences, right? Where somebody just goes, hey, we just live for the moment. I don't think he misled you here. I think he would not agree to date you. And, you know, he, he sort of left it open-ended, but that's what happens. You, these negotiations and this clarification of what each person wants out of a, out of a relationship, they're the best time for them to happen. <laughs> It's not like right when sex is about to happen. People's thinking is very distorted. So Connie says, we had sex a few times and then after a week we had a conversation and it came up that he wanted to be alone, but have it all. So he wants to keep seeing me like we were doing, but nothing more, meaning what casual sex, but by alone, not dating, not in any kind of a boyfriend, girlfriend thing or having dinner. And then you say, I got really sad and then really furious. And I went into a little rage against him that I'm not proud of, which I can only describe as the abandonment melange that you and Pete Walker talk about. So yeah, I totally get it. The abandonment melange. I, I don't blame you at all for having abandonment melange. And I don't blame you for being confused because I know that you were traumatized when you were a kid and you would have learned some of these structures about how to communicate and how to read people and how to know where they're coming from. So you felt sad and mad at him because it turns out that after he said he didn't want to date, he, he actually didn't want to date. He, he was hoping to keep having casual sex. And I don't think that highly of him because he knew that you were worried about that. And, you know, anybody could have seen that you wanted that boundary, but you weren't holding it. And usually that happens, Connie, because we need to be loved so bad. There's such a deficit of love going on in our lives that we kind of unconsciously want to take whatever we can get and then just hope, 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 like somehow it'll turn out differently this time. But here's the thing is that having relationships like this that are casual communicate something about us that's not attractive for healthy people who want a committed relationship. People like healthy people, they're looking for people who have boundaries, who are demonstrating that they care very much, you know, what kind of a relationship they get into. And in fact, it can be kind of part of romance to have to like chase somebody a little bit, to have to get up on your toes and try a little harder for them. And so if some guy just sort of says, oh yeah, whatever, casual sex. And you're like, well, I don't really want it, but okay. You're communicating something that they don't take seriously. You're basically telling them not to take you seriously and not to consider your needs. I don't think that's good. I don't think that's good that they take advantage of that. But the person who's got to change this dynamic because you want it changed is you. So you said then, the thing is, I feel like the no casual sex boundary I put up scares away guys before they can develop feelings. I want to give you a new idea about this because the fact is good guys 
who want a good relationship do develop feelings before sex happens. That's why they have sex, because they have feelings for somebody, all right? So there's always gonna be people out there who have casual sex and they say it's fine and it works for them. But if you have CPTSD and you've suffered with this, you know, that's just not a luxury you have, okay? And luckily, the world is full of people who would like to have a good relationship too. And what you're communicating when you, when you say that you prefer no casual sex, but you go ahead and have it, you're communicating that there's um, that you have difficulty setting boundaries, that maybe there's some trauma there. Um, it suggests that maybe um, a lot of trouble could walk into your life. And I just want you to put yourself in another person's shoes who's looking for a relationship. They want to see somebody solid, right? They want to see you with all your self-respect and you being picky. And honestly, that is very attractive to both men and women when somebody in front of them is self-respecting in that way, who has standards. People who just want casual sex, yes, they will be turned away. They will not be interested in you if you have that boundary. Good, we want them out of here. We want them to go hang out with the people who want what they want. You want something different. You're looking for something different. Now I have this course, um, Dating and Relationships for People with Childhood PTSD, and the very first exercise I have in there, and it's actually really hard for a lot of people to do. It's to write down what you actually want. And you write down what are like deal breakers for what you actually want in somebody. And so for you, it might be no casual sex. I want somebody who, who is only interested in a serious relationship and would be interested in dating to get to know each other before it turns sexual. All right, you can, you can write that on your list. And the magical thing about writing this down, I mean, you can still break your own rules. It's always possible, many of us do. But once you write that down, you have a clarity about you where you know when you meet somebody, you're allowed to communicate that to somebody and then find out what they say about it. And then you decide if you're going to begin dating them. I would for you suggest just like dating is really essential. If dating sounds like too heavy or too much of a commitment for somebody, they're not appropriate for you to have sex with, not appropriate to hang out with, okay? All right, so then you said he said, you're just like my ex, she's also afraid to get hurt. Well, I just gotta wonder, like, why is she afraid of getting hurt? <laughs> is, is he also asking her to have some sort of casual open relationship and she's afraid of getting hurt? So, hmm, okay, wondering. And he, he said, you need to trust someone 100% and if something happens you don't like, that's when you take the trust back. Okay, right there, he kinda lost me. Um, that is a manipulative thing to say, uh, I, but you're an adult and you know darn well that's not true. You say it's compelling, but the only reason it's compelling is because it allows you to have that magical thinking that if you just have sex with him now, he's gonna fall in love with you. And I, I think that's always in a situation with this dynamic, that's extremely unlikely that that's going to happen. If they have to tell you that, look, just trust me 100% and then, and then don't trust, I, I can't think of any situation where trust means that. He's, it's basically describing having no boundaries and then being discarded, all right? And then accepting that. So that's, that's what you were being set up for there. And again, because he said this, he said this is where he's coming from up front. I'm still, I know a lot of people are gonna write in and say, what about the guy, he's, you know, he's responsible. And it's like, he may be, I don't like what he's doing here. I think he's taking advantage of a vulnerable person, but he didn't write me. So I'm, I'm answering you, Connie, because I wanna help you just get your power back. I want you to get your power back so you can begin to have love and have the kind of relationship you want and never get treated like dirt again. Never again, okay? All right, one thing you say here is when he said that you should trust him 100% and then just not trust once he screws you over, you say, I think generally he's a good, I don't think he's trying to manipulate me, but generally he's a good guy just with poor communication skills. And right there, this is where, this is where I think your thinking got really distorted. I, I wholeheartedly disagree with you. I think he's got fabulous communication skills to, that he's using to manipulate. I mean, when you suspect that he just had poor communication skills, what did you think he meant to say? I don't think you have any reason to think he meant something other than what he did, which is use you and discard you, which is try to continue having totally casual sex with you no strings attached at all, right? And while he is technically alone. And honestly, having sex, that's not alone. That's not alone. That's all he wants, all right? I think he has good communication skills. All right, so then Connie, you said, I'm conflicted because men value their freedom and they need trust. Well, we all value our freedom and we all need trust, all right? 
but I need commitment and I don't want this to keep happening. I'm with you. It does not have to keep happening, but here we go. You say, because it has gone this way so many times, I tend to meet guys who are done with me after sex. All right, again, I'm just going to put this out there. What if you date guys for X number of months before sex is even on the table? I know then you say, well, they fake their whole personality to get me into bed. I don't think this guy faked his personality. I think he showed his cards for what he wanted from the get-go. If you had had proper parenting, Connie, what your parents would have taught you is about how um, people, not just men, but people, when they want sex, they're going to put on their best behavior. They're going to look for ways to get you to say yes. All right. And that's not love. It's not love. It's totally, a, it's, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a flirting thing that people do and it totally works for some people. But when you have a big attachment wound, like you do, it tends to just lead to trouble and grief. Okay. So then you said, and then when they conquer me, they're done. And it makes me feel like an empty shell of a woman. I don't want to respond to this with using sex as a bargaining chip. And you say, I think that's how my boundary gets interpreted. So somewhere in there, you got programmed that you having boundaries about wanting to be courted, wanting to be wanting somebody to be into you, wanting them to date you and treat you well and show you that they are capable of a committed relationship. You got an idea that you're being needy, that you're just bargaining. That's so not true. What you're describing there is just respecting your own intentions and what you want in your life. And it's, and, and what you're talking about here, what you want is a good thing to want. I want you, I want you to be properly loved for anybody who had a tough childhood, who longs for a relationship. One of the most wonderful things that can happen is to end up being loved by somebody solid. All right. That's something I never thought I was going to have. And I get to have it now. And I, you're supposed to say stuff like, Oh, a relationship won't fix you. And it won't, it's not going to fix your childhood PTSD, but it's profoundly healing to be loved by somebody who's committed to you. So if you're going to have that, and you have this attachment wound, it's just time to clear out anybody who doesn't fit the bill. If that's not what they want, then they're not the one for you. And if you feel like you can't ask them what they want, then they're not the one for you. When you get to know somebody, you'll feel safe enough to ask them what they want. You'll be able to have deep conversations about your common interests and goals. You can say, you know, I'm interested in finding the love of my life and getting married. And, um, you know, I might start dating you if, if it turns out that we're compatible, maybe we can get to know each other a little bit. Getting to know each other means coffee. All right. Maybe a lunch dinner starts going into dating, right? So dating with the intention of getting to know each other romantically. Now, this is the part that nobody ever wants to hear, but if you have attachment wounds, the longer you can postpone sex, the better chance you give yourself of being able to discern if this person is, is a fit for you. And you're going to be surprised. Like, like when you haven't had that good person yet before you, you will imagine that they hold all the cards, that they are the ones who decide whether they're going to give that love to you. But when you have a chance to be in such a relationship, you're going to find out there's a whole bunch of complexity to you too. And when you get to know somebody, you're going to have mixed feelings come up. Sometimes you'll gradually realize that this person is not who you want, even though they love you. That can happen too. You may have never even had room to have that dynamic. So you're giving both people time to get to know each other and discern what's there. And if you've had a lot of like hurtful relationships in the past, there's going to be rough days as you get closer and closer to somebody. There's going to be rough times, rough conversations. Old wounds are going to come up. Old PTSD reactions where, you know, you're fearful or paranoid or desperate feeling. And when you have a really good friendship underneath that and a mutual commitment that you're dating now, that that's what you're doing, that you're hanging in there with each other, it might not mean you get married yet, but while you're dating, having that kind of security, it gives you a little bit of room to have your feelings come up. Because if this person's going to marry you, they need to know like that you have some fragile places. You have certain situations where you become a little bit like, you know, emotional or unreasonable even. That's just part of it. That's part of what we have to accept in each other. Of course, we don't want to accept any kind of abuse and nobody should take that from us. But you, so you had said, how can I relax with guys and explore the connection without being so hyper-focused on the end result? 
while keeping my boundaries and being true to myself. All right. I think you have a pretty good goal there, except the part about the end result. I think you do need to hyper-focus on the end result because you know exactly the result that you want in your life and that if that result is a problem, (laughs) they are not somebody to go out with. It's so simple. And I promise you, if you can actually set that boundary for yourself, like write it down, decide when, and if some guy takes an interest in you, definitely before any sex, you put out there, you put out there to him what your boundaries are, what they are. A boundary, by the way, is what you walk out of. You can say all you want, but unless you break up with a guy or refuse to go on a date with him, it's not a boundary, right? So you're the one who's going to keep that boundary. You're going to be willing to walk away from a perfectly grand Saturday night with somebody because it's somebody who doesn't want a relationship. That's the boundary. You say, I'm sorry, this doesn't sound like what I'm looking for, but nice to meet you. That's a boundary. The last thing you said about your goal was that you wanted to be true to yourself. And I love that goal. That is the best ultimate goal. To be true to yourself, you have to be honest with yourself about what you really want. And so if that committed relationship is what you want, then being true to yourself and holding boundaries around it definitely means no more casual sex. So that's just something that you can decline from now on. And you're going to be surprised when you actually set the boundary. You're going to be surprised how people respond to you differently almost immediately. There have probably been a lot of situations where a man was seriously interested in you, but something about your pattern signaled to him that you were not ready for a serious relationship, right? So you're going to notice a difference right away when you actually have that boundary. So I hope you can continue supporting yourself, healing your trauma, connecting with women who can help you be clear about your boundaries from day to day. And when you go out on a date to have women you can talk to and say, okay, let me tell you what happened. Can you help give me feedback? Like, do you, what signals am I getting from this guy? And that's what, that's what women do for each other. We help each other interpret reality. And it's really important to be with people who are also on a healing path, not who are in some sort of negative Um, acting out behavior who are just going to be cynical and negative, but people who are also trying to build something better for themselves. Dear Anna, I need help. A nine-year relationship with a married man ended a couple years ago because his wife found out about our relationship. He and his wife wrote to my boss telling him that he should have fired me, stressing that I'm older than this man. He was 40, I was 52, as everything ended. I've never tried to contact him. I had a very bad time trying to rebuild my life. I've changed jobs, moved out, and tried to let everything connected to him get behind me. Of course, I've had a very bad childhood. Both my sisters suffered to such an extent that they turned out to become seriously mentally ill, schizophrenia, etc., she says. You understand how this works in life, and we stay with people who do not care at all about us, because for us... It is enough to have someone to love without even needing to be loved back, which is so useful for a man who is cheating on his wife. I take full responsibility for the harm I've caused to the wife of that man. They have two daughters. It was very hard already during the nine years, thinking I was doing something wrong. But, well, I've chosen to do what apparently he was needing. I I have really huge problems to starting any relationship. I feel very bad with 99% of people. I had to come back and circle a couple things I want to talk about here. So I got my pencil. I feel very bad with 99% of people, even if nobody knows about it, because I hide my discomfort and everybody thinks I'm outgoing and happy. That's what we call a covert avoider. Okay, so I stay alone and I do not wish to have any man in my life. The man started to pay visits to my LinkedIn account, which I use for my work. And this is worrying me. I miss the possibility to love someone, even if I do not want to have a man in my life. I'm profoundly convinced I have to stay away from him. But this is the logical part of myself. I'm afraid of the irrational part of myself. You know, that people like us have a black hole inside which can easily eat our lives uh, before we know it. If he were so stupid to pop up again, I'm not sure that I would have the strength to stay away from the big mistake 
to start to talk with him again. I know you say that we CPTSD people tend to start relationships too quickly, but I need years before I can build any trust, and this never worked with normal people. You go slowly in relationships. Okay. The married people are not in a hurry. They can comfortably wait, so here we are. He took time and built up intimacy with me day by day in about two years, and he was my boss, she says. Oof before something started between us. I was coming out of the darkness of a profound mourn. My mother had died of pancreatic cancer, and she was the person I loved beyond every limit, even if she's always been very avoidant. Aha. She had been abused all her childhood and had problems to be loved, I imagine. About my father, well, I do not write a word. It's too difficult. Mm, okay. So here we are. I need some words to hold my position that is staying away from the wrong situations and wrong people. You know how hard this is with a wrong background. I send you a big hug and thank you so much for being the lovely and brilliant person you are. With a lot of gratitude, Serena. Oh, thank you. Thank you for your kind words, Serena. Um, I, oh, I feel for you so much. I'm so proud of you. I'm just so proud of you. Um, you're like so many of us, vulnerable, needing love so bad that you end up Oh, nine years. Oh, that must hurt so much. That's so much of your life and so much time when you didn't get into a relationship that was durable. And um, you're not alone. Even people who didn't have trauma, you know, have long relationships. And yeah, I hear you. This is very sad. The whole time he wasn't really with you and he had a wife and oh dear. And it's been two years. And so I hear your question. Your question is, how do you stay away from him if he tries to make contact? So first of all, if it's any comfort, it's not unusual for people to just look at a LinkedIn profile and it doesn't mean necessarily that they're going to contact you. And I know you know this, but I'm just going to put it out there. Um, there's that, you know what you can do with LinkedIn is you can stop paying the extra money. It, you have to pay the monthly fee be, to see who's looking at your profile. And I know for a fact that some, for some people that is a trigger and they're always wondering who looked at them and some people hide their settings and you just see that somebody in this industry looked at you and you're like, could it be, could it be? And that's like classic limerence behavior, right? Where, where you're looking for that stuff. Now I'm not hearing that from you. I'm hearing you just saw that he looked and I'm sure it gave your you know, your heart and your feelings, a big surge right there of just like, oh, what is this? But let's just say he comes back. So I think that your strength here, the strength to stay out of a bad relationship, also the strength to stay out of limerence for anybody listening. Limerence is like a obsession or infatuation that some other people here suffer with. And it's the same sort of thing where you really want to put it down. One of the best things you can do to set yourself up to succeed at healing these old feelings for people that you do not want to have anymore is to have a great life. Limerence and, and attachment to an empty relationship are all trauma-driven behaviors that they find fertile soil when our lives are empty, boring, and lonely. So what's important for you to have is friends, fun and interesting, mentally challenging things where you feel like you're actually growing as a person. So if it's been two years, it looks, sounds like you're 55. This is a great age for you to start to be developing stuff that you actually are interested in. Now, if I was in pain, I think I would find it really annoying if I asked for help and somebody said, you should join a club, you should read books. <laughs> but I'm actually going to say that because sometimes when you, if you've been living in a broken relationship for many years, your friendships haven't developed, your hobbies haven't developed. It's been draining that energy and that creativity out of you. If you had been in a happy relationship all that time, that energy and creativity would probably be showing up as like flowers in the garden, right? And um, a beautifully stocked closet full of folded linen and all these things. I don't know, I fantasize about these things. Like if I didn't have PTSD, I'd love to have nice things like that. My life isn't that perfect, but, uh, but I have a lot more order and sweetness in my life. I do have a garden. I do read books. I have um, gatherings at my house where people have, we have speakers and we present ideas. And these are all things that I needed to do to myself just to be well, just to be well. I need to exercise. I need to take basic care of my appearance. I need to take basic care of the relationships with my family. All of those things work together to make me strong and resilient. And so if anything were to come along to either upset me or tempt me to cause harm, I have a lot of resilience against it because I'm really well grounded in my life. And that's what I want to present to you. And I think when, when you have your heart broken, this stuff sounds terribly boring. I remember that, but it's not terribly boring. It's terribly sweet. When you don't have it, 
than even this crappy guy who reported you to your boss, who was your, he was your former boss and he told the employer on you. Oh dear. Oh, you know, there, there's a part of you that knows so well that this guy is not even your friend. There's nothing to talk about anymore. But I also want to talk about the shame you feel. I read your letter before I read it aloud. And I remember my first kind of like impression of your letter was that there was a lot of shame there and that you were struggling a bit with it. And you were reminding yourself again and again, because this happens to people like us. And I'm here to say, you are so right. It does happen to people like us. And it's not our fault we have CPTSD. But when we hurt other people, which is what that is, having an affair is hurting other people. And not just the wife, but him and the children and yourself and the people in your life who may have been counting on you to be present and emotionally real with them. So a whole bunch of people get hurt when there's a deceitful relationship. I'm not saying you're a bad person. I'm just saying there's, there's a source for that feeling of shame. That, that's where it's coming from. And the beautiful thing is you can clear that up. Now, when you've had an affair, the, the clearing up is never going to involve making contact again. With other people, it may be, it would be appropriate to call them up and talk about what, what happened and what you did and apologize. But with somebody, when it's an ex, even if there wasn't an affair, even if it was just a, you know, a relationship that fell apart, the reason we don't contact exes is because they are either, we know they're in a relationship or they might be in a relationship and our contacting them would create that charge that you got when you saw that LinkedIn thing. It would activate old feelings in them, which is by nature toxic to the relationship they're in. So here's this innocent party, the spouse or partner that somebody else is with. And if you really want to clear up the wrong of the whole thing and stop feeling ashamed, you raise up your regard for those people and the way that they were hurt. And the best thing you can do when they've already been hurt like that is shut the door and do not make an appearance in their life. Don't make an appearance in their life. That's the best thing you can do. All right. So no contact is needed, no clearing up, but a decision like you're not going to do that. And so you have predicted that the hard thing will be for you if he contacts you and tries to stir things up again. And you know, that's entirely possible because people who have affairs are like that, right? People who haven't healed yet or people who haven't gotten in touch with the terrible feelings that that brings up of, of emptiness. And I, I was interested in what you said that it takes you a really long time to trust somebody. So he was a coworker. So you were around him for two years. And since he was married, you weren't like inconveniencing him by just being a platonic, you know, employee there and he could put up with it. But you fear, you fear, and I'm going to call this fear because I don't think it's right. You fear that nobody would ever put up with the time that you need to trust. But A, I think you can work on your trust issues by first really making a clear resolve and creating a plan for what you're going to do if this ex contacts you. And one thing you can do is start to build up your network of understanding friends who you can text right then and go, okay, he did it. He did it. He looked at my profile again, or I saw his car or, you know, these things that happen, they happen. And it's funny, they seem to happen by magic sometimes, right? When you're most vulnerable, you're not vulnerable when you have a, a life that's fun, when you're not lonely because you have friends. Okay. So those are the first orders of business. You, you get your life together, then you're going to have a resolve and you're going to feel the integrity in yourself of having that resolve that no matter what, you are not going to re-engage with him. You know, nothing good can come from that. There's nothing more to talk about. I'm sure you guys talked about everything there was to say. It's just sad. It's a sad loss and you will be able to handle it. Life is full of losses. There are many of them. People come and go out of our lives. And the thing about romance is, and I know this was nine years, but it was nine unfulfilling years where you never really got to be with him. So you say I, you have a choice that you don't really want to be with anybody. And that's a totally okay choice. You can not be with anybody or you can be happy and be open-minded about it happening if you want. So if that's your goal, then your happiness becomes very attractive. Whether it's a friend or a romantic interest person, your trust level can, it doesn't have to take two years when you are acting with integrity, when you're able to make yourself promises about not responding if he contacts you you know, maintaining a, a no contact with him and that you will protect your boundaries in new situations and be clear what they are. Now, if, so if dating were something that you think you might be open to sometime, some people take my dating course. And in that one, I have everybody write down, you know, what is it that you actually want? 
And it can be, you can also write down things that you will never tolerate again. So one really good thing to put on that never do again is like somebody who's not available, they're married or they have a girlfriend or they have an addiction or, you know, for some people, they even put on somebody who is, if it's a long distance relationship, don't get into it. For a lot of people who are avoidant, um, and you talk about covert avoidance of looking happy. One of the biggest reasons why people with CPTSD go into isolation or covertly avoid other people, like you go be social, but you never really connect with anybody, which sounds like where you are, that we do that because people are just too triggering to get in. But when you have some healing, people are less triggering and you have boundaries so that you know if everything gets out of hand or you realize somebody's awful, you step out. You know that you can do it. And in the past, when our CPTSD ruled our lives, then being in a hectic relationship or a painful situation, it was like a death sentence because you couldn't get yourself out. The attachment wound is too strong and the abandonment wound is too tenacious and to, to ever step out of it. So we either have to get like dumped or the person has to die. And that's where it comes to when those things are operating very strongly. But see, you can heal, you can have less of that. When you know that you can exercise choice, you can use your discernment and you can you open your heart at your own speed and feel good about yourself, head high, cleared up all the problems, then you will find your trust issues are a little bit easier for yourself. But you know what? It is totally fine if you don't open up your heart very quickly. We do do that as people with CPTSD. We want to rush in because instinctively we know, like it might slip away. We're probably making a bad choice. That feeling like you have to hurry, that's what we do when it's a bad choice. So there's, there's time. There's time for you to hang out and pay attention and use dating. If you decide to ever date again, use dating as a way to decide to take in information. Do I like this person? Do I want to let them in my life? That's appropriate. So I think that you're in a good spot. I think you're in a good spot. And I just can intuit that you're having trouble forgiving yourself for what happened. So I just wanted to give you one final thing about what to do about that feeling of like, uh, you know, if you feel like nothing you do could ever set the thing right, being that I don't recommend you make contact with the family again, is you become ready. Should you ever bump into a member of that family on the street that you know what you would say, you know what you would say. There's a very small chance that would happen. You run into the wife, you're both confronted with each other. You would know what you need to say. You would be ready. You would have done the work and you can get help with that kind of thing uh, from a therapist or a 12 step program or in my uh, courses and my membership program, you can get help from others sort of determining how would I apologize for this. I also have videos on how to apologize. So you would be ready. You would be ready to apologize and just knowing and doing that work. It, I think it's important to work it out with another person and you read it to a friend. You read it to an understanding friend who, who understands what you're doing and they hear you and they say, yes, good work, Serena. That's good. If you ever run into that person, that, that would be a good thing to say. That way you've done the work in your heart and you're going to find each time you do the work like that, you can hold your head up. You can feel the integrity of yourself and you will have the capacity to trust people more because you can trust yourself more. Frank writes, Dear Fairy, I myself definitely have some CPTSD issues. I had an alcoholic mother and as an adult have been a definite rescuer. Circling here with my pencil. A crisis in my marriage has brought my attention to these issues. So I'll circle things that I want to come back to after we just read through it. We're going to read through it one time and I'll see if I can help you, Frank. My wife had a way worse childhood. She has left to chase a limerent object. That's a person who someone is limerent over, kind of obsessed in a fantasy realm, but not a real realm. She has left to chase a limerent object and moved in with him. She won't initiate divorce and she's told her good friend that she hopes one day maybe we can work it out. In reality, the only thing stopping that is she won't stop. I think she's heavily caught in the fantasy. Do I continue to wait? Am I just acting out my own childhood by sticking around waiting for her to return? We have four kids and I hate to divorce and formally break up the family, but is that the wake up call she needs to shake her from the fantasy? I don't want to be a slave to my own trauma, but I can't seem to just really be done with the relationship. I've already waited six months. So I asked Frank, I said, well, tell me more. This is intriguing, but I need to know more. Um, where are your kids and what does your wife say about the possibility of return? 
So he says there's four kids, they're now split in custody 50-50. And yes, unfortunately, he says, this man has taken a role in the kid's life. We went to a marriage workshop at the beginning of the year designed for marriages in this scenario, and they actually teach about limerence, so it's where I first learned about it. They teach that while your spouse is limerent, they're not going to be rational at all, that in addition to this, what they're doing likely goes against all their values. This being the case, they find themselves in major cognitive dissonance and become very confused. This has been her to a T. When you ask her, it, it is a lot of, I don't know, which from my coaching with the previous organization is very common. They also tend to vilify the spouse, me, to justify their actions, which she did badly in the beginning. She also has complained about just following her heart, but not knowing what her values really are anymore. I've noticed you mentioned it's very common with CPTSD, but it's also, it's common in limerence because they're trying to justify their actions due to the immense amount of cognitive dissonance they're in. When I kind of pushed for divorce, she was willing to acquiesce, but I pushed her specifically wanting to know what she thought because she has accused me all these years of doing whatever I wanted, and she knew she didn't make her voice heard. So I pushed back and asked what she wanted. She said she didn't want to string me along, but that she's on a journey right now and feels like she needs to see it through. So cryptically, she's saying, I wish you'd hold on. She's made some efforts to establish more of a friendship with me. Considering a few months ago, she said I was a monster that was controlling and, quote, abusive, it is a large about face. So there are small signs that she's warming up a little. Another is that she had agreed to participate in a Bible study with an old friend long distance. And she's even recently told me she started reading her Bible again and praying more. We used to be pretty strong in our faith. And during and before this, we both had kind of walked away. At the same time, she's not taking discernible and credible actions to repair our relationship. She continues to live most of her life as though there is no thought of returning. There are times I feel like she is simply having her cake and eating it too, keeping me on the back burner. This isn't who I've known my wife to be all these years. At the same time, none of this is. My wife used to be the most rigid and planned out person. In fact, her hobby is decorating happy planners with stickers and stuff. Yet when asked about the future, she says, I don't really have a plan, but I think that's kind of the point for me to figure it out as I go. It's tough because this organization educates that limerence will eventually end. They'll come out of the fog and may realize what a mess they've made of their life. And I think you've done the best I've seen at describing the fantasy that limerence is, the drug that it is. My wife never wanted to be like the addicts in her family. Sadly, she is hooked on the guy and you can tell she's falling apart. I love my family. I love my kids. I never wanted them to have a broken home. Yeah. I'm someone that is committed to being the best person I can be. I struggle immensely because I don't want to let my kids down. They miss their mom, uh, even though they see her half the time. My wife used to stay at home and even homeschool the kids, so it's a major hole in their life. At the same time, I don't want to just be a mindless slave to my past and cling to a dead relationship. So I wrote to Frank again at that point because what had caught my ear is that she said she accused him of being abusive. And I'm like, why does she say that? So he gave me a little more background. He said, we've been together 15 years, married for 12. We have four kids. And she has most of her life been a stay-at-home mom and even homeschooled the kids. When we were first married... You see, it's, it's sort of like unfolding, isn't it? <laughs> when we were first married, during our first year, she became very depressed and abused some of her prescription pills and actually had an affair that was limited to a couple of times. She came clean with me pretty early on, and I forgave her, chalking it up to her deep depression and young, foolish behavior. After that, she threw herself into our faith and became an excellent mother. She cared for our kids and was probably, looking back, terribly self-sacrificial, never knowing when to stop or when to indulge in self-care. We also struggled financially many years, and so life has been stressful without a doubt. Fast forward to about a year ago, and we both, due to COVID, had stopped being active in our faith. She expressed concern and wanted me to take our faith more seriously. She warned me that she feared without it, things would fall apart. I didn't realize how dependent she was on it for a sense of values and purpose. 
Shortly thereafter, we made a regretful decision to experiment in our marriage with a threesome, and this is how she met this other guy. This came out rather late in the letter writing process. We were in such a great place at that time that I wasn't threatened in the least. By the time I realized how bad it was, it was too late and she was in the grips of limerence. Earlier this year, she moved out of our home. She lives with the guy. They got together. We split custody. By all accounts, this guy is not exactly a better choice, but she says her relationship is different with him and they work well together. He's the complete opposite of me in many ways, and I know he, too, has a porn addiction. Two? Okay. It feels as if there are two addicts together having their own way. She's pretty depressed, suffering from an increased number of panic attacks, and has taken up smoking as well as gained quite a bit of weight. She's very vague about the future and doesn't push for divorce. For now, she's living each day for herself. She won't discuss our relationship with me and is full of more, I don't know, which I'm told can be her cognitive dissonance. I want to save my family, but I fear I'm simply acting out of my pattern of saving my alcoholic mother as a child by waiting around for my wife. This whole thing has brought to light that we both had a pretty codependent relationship with each other, and I've worked on myself the last six months to fix these problems. I love my wife dearly, but she has hurt me considerably. I know forgiveness is possible. Trust can be rebuilt, but am I just hanging on because it's what love is to me? Am I just fitting myself to crap? What's the healthy thing to do? I'm honestly confused, and I keep going back and forth. I hate the idea of not having my kids full-time, separate holidays, etc., but is it inevitable? And then I asked Frank what he thought was hard for her. Why did she say she left? And he said... I would say the controlling and abusive aspect of the relationship that she refers to were mostly in light of codependency. As the ways you'd expect a rescuing partner who kind of takes on a parental role in a relationship, I was overly critical and not empathic enough, and I would say to some of her issues through the years, they were all more covert issues of control, and some was likely backed up by my super conservative religious background, you know, the husband is head of the household and that whole thing. This was amplified by the fact that she is super avoidant, which I didn't know. So any issues she had through the years, she never spoke up about. I've felt to always be a person that if you confront me, I'm willing to consider change. I look back, though, and I realize I have definitely been super defensive and would often blame shift issues in the past, too. I really struggled at needing to be right about many things. I'm sure it made her feel crazy at times. Okay. Likewise, I'd say for many years I felt super manipulated. My brother-in-law, who lived with us for several years, told me he felt like my wife would often play the victim and pout until she got her way. So I feel like we both had our super unhealthy ways of getting what we wanted. But by and large, I thought we were pretty happy. There was never physical abuse and never anything really purposely done to hurt each other. It was more just shitty communication patterns and stuff from our families of origin, really. In a nutshell, I can see that I've been overly focused on myself through these years and should have been more insistent on taking in her perspective and at times deferring to her to make a decision even if she was reluctant. I definitely have carried over really toxic communication strategies from my childhood too that I've worked to untangle. I use things like nonviolent communication, which is a technique to better handle conflict. I've allowed my emotional dysregulation to run the show for many years and made many life decisions based far more on these emotions that are from a really crappy framework. This has caused me to constantly change my mind, be difficult to criticize, and often selfish. I so related to having no emotions during really bad times, and so I'd lack proper empathy and support. I have read several books on codependency and have worked to stop being the fixer and advice giver in life. I've dramatically reduced the behaviors in the last six months. I have attended CODA and my own therapy. I've apologized for anything and everything I recognize I've done, perhaps too much, and I've asked for forgiveness. I've accepted my lack of control and ability to only change myself and have reacquainted myself with my faith in a much healthier and less judgmental manner. Can you help, Frank? Okay. Frank, my goodness, this is a really tough situation. I read this whole letter with all the parts of it because I think it's such a um, strong example of how complicated life can be, how there's no easy answer, 
how we suffer through these things because we're human. And, um, but I'm going to try. Let's see if I can help shed some insight for you. So you wrote, you had an alcoholic mother. I did too, and I, I just relate to that. Um, you've been a definite rescuer. Mm -hmm. And you really, the crisis in your marriage has brought that out. Your, your wife had an even worse thing. You mentioned she had addicts in her family. And she has left you for what you call a limerent object and moved in with him. And she won't initiate divorce. And she's told her friend that she hopes it might work out. Um, and you were wondering, do I continue to wait? Now, this is interesting. I expect in the comments, we're going to have two camps and one's going to say, stick it out. And one's going to say, leave. And the reason we're going to see that is because this is, it's a very complicated situation and it doesn't have an easy answer. Um, I normally don't comment on the person who didn't write in, but I, I feel like I have a sense of what could be going on with her. So I'll be commenting on that a little bit. So, so you're splitting custody 50-50. Um, you went to a marriage workshop at the beginning of the year when this whole thing first started, um, when she, I guess, first got limerent and it was about limerence and, and she agreed that's what was going on. They said, don't make rash decisions. She did anyway. She moved out to live with this guy. So it was interesting because the first letter I got from you was very short and somehow I detected like there's, there's this brewing storm here, but you hadn't said what it is. And I just, I don't know, I, I cannot kind of understand that I'm really used to as a person with trauma and drama in my life. I compartmentalized it. I didn't want everybody to see it, but I thought it was just kind of interesting when you wrote to me how much important detail was left out. And maybe you just needed to be asked. So I asked, we had several rounds of communication. Um, and your answers made sense to me, but they came, they all came as a surprise because it didn't, I was like, oh, that's, that explains a lot. So... Yeah, somebody who's limerent is not going to be rational. They will be in cognitive dissonance. They'll be confused. They'll blame you for what's going on. That all sounds about right. It's really trippy that she went to that workshop with you. So interesting that there is such a thing. And she went, but, you know, she, it just doesn't sound like she, her heart was in it, but she tried or she was willing to go through the motions of trying. The feeling I get about her is that she's been doing that all her life that she's has not been able to develop an identity or what she wants. I think that might be what's going on. And then when you ask her, she says a lot of, I don't know, I just don't know. And they, you were told that could be her cognitive dissonance. And that's just a funny way for saying, yeah, she, she doesn't know. She's unclear what she's feeling or doing. She just finds herself running away from home. Her actions speak louder than what she, what her intentions are expressed to be, but also Keep in mind, she's trying not to hurt you. She probably has a horror of hurting you and how she's let you down and how it's affecting the kids. So she is probably putting the lightest spin on this possible. That doesn't mean I can read her mind, but just normally that's what a person does unless they really want to hurt you. And I'm not hearing that that was the case for either of you. But you said, um, when I kind of pushed her for divorce, and I get it, you maybe tried to force a decision like, what is this? Are we getting divorced or are we getting back together? I need to know one way or the other. Very fair, okay, even if she couldn't say anything. And she said, you specifically wanted to know what she thought because she kept saying, you know, I never got to weigh in. You know, my feelings were never considered in all of this. So you were like, come on, you know, let me know how you feel. I do want to know. And I'm proud of you that you, you know, you were able to turn, change that about the dynamic where you really like kept opening up the space for her to say how she felt. It didn't get the answer you wanted, but you did it. And that's really good. That's a really good thing. She didn't want to string me along. She's on a journey right now and it feels like she needs to see it through. So cryptically, you said, she's saying, I wish you'd hold on. Um, okay, so the key sign of limerence is that somebody is looking for signs. And so this is the interesting thing, Frank. I think you're in a bit of limerence. I don't think she is. And you know why? Because she's actually living with the guy. She may be in a, um, I don't know. I, I agree she's in kind of an altered state of some kind of trying to, uh, well, well, we'll talk about her in a minute because that it is speculation. But I just think that you looking for signs that what she really wants is to come back. It feels a little bit like you're looking at signs you say later that all of her, none of her actions support you know, credible, you know, consistent and credible action towards getting back together. When somebody has strayed and they want to get back together, you know, what they would do if they were sincere about it is anything they had to do. They would just keep showing up. They would do everything that you've been doing. They would take the classes, read the books, see the therapist, 
try to come up with what was my part in it? What can I heal in myself? Like you've done an amazing job of that. I don't hear that she's doing that. I hear she's in a flight mode. She's running away. And just because it's, um, it reflects a s internal struggle or a trauma reaction, it doesn't mean it's not real. She really has run away. And that's the sad thing about this. You can't really explain that fact away with her trauma or limerence or anything. But the thing about limerence is once you're actually with somebody, limerence goes away because you're living with them. You can't really have a fantasy that everything would be great. What I've noticed is that people who are limerent, like limerence, we're vulnerable to it if we were terribly neglected as kids and our lives suck. So I think that may have been what was happening with her. Her life was feeling empty. She had a terrible childhood. So a fantasy relationship where you just think, if we were together, oh my gosh, it would just be so amazing. Actually being together with anybody totally kills that. You go, whoa, what a disappointment, right? It's not like the fantasy. And a lot of people will avoid actual relationships with the person they're limerent over at least on a subconscious level, because they know the, that real life would kill the fantasy that's keeping them going. But what that fantasy is doing is allowing a person to avoid the pain of their life and the difficult decisions they have to face. So whatever this is coming from, whatever you want to call it, she's being a terrible partner to you. She's just being a terrible partner to you. There's no answers. What she is to herself is one thing. What she is to you is another. What I hear you doing is abandoning yourself and hopping the fence and trying to figure her out, trying to excuse her actions, trying to create a bridge for her. And I don't blame you. Having four kids together is a serious thing. And of course you want to save the marriage. And I don't blame you for trying. But I would just say, I see you. You did do a lot of work on yourself. But I'm going to recommend to you, Frank, that you really get self-disciplined about focusing on your own side and not trying to make her see anything, not try to figure her out, not try to make her come back. Like if she's going to do that, she will let you know. She will let you know. You don't have to do a thing. You can start focusing on your life and following the split custody agreement. I have a little concern about that as a, you know, previously single mom before. One thing that I noticed is that when you're separated but not divorced, you have one set of rights as a parent. When you're actually divorced, you have a different set. And when you're divorced, for example, and this is in my state, I don't know if it's absolutely true for everybody in the world here, when you're divorced, you ha your spouse cannot take kids out of the country without your consent. So if there was any concern that she would run off with the kids or anything like that, I mean, it sounds like she's not in a position to, but just going to say, you know, I would recommend you at least speak to a lawyer about this and find out about implications for parenting money, spousal support and all that, and um, not try to do this all emotionally. I think divorce is certainly like a possibility right now. And you knowing the facts does nothing but helps you make a clear, you know, a better decision for yourself, whether it's for or against divorce. I would not condemn you if you decided to wait longer on this one. It sounds like a crazy situation. What's the hurry? But I would like you and your kids to be legally protected for crazy shenanigans that might arise because I don't know much about these other people, but it sounds not great. You know, it doesn't sound great. I think it's really sad because the kids need contact with both of you. I, uh, you're doing a great job at it. I know how half custody is not the same, but there are things you can do to make that as good as possible. So, but this was interesting, Frank. You said when you kind of push for divorce, um, and you pushed her wanting to know her opinion. She pushed back and she said she's on a journey. She needs to see it through. You thought she was cryptically saying, I want to come back. Maybe, but I, I don't think so. She's made some efforts to establish more of a friendship, which is good because you're co-parenting. And a few months ago, she thought you were a monster. You were controlling and abusive. And she's come around on that. So good. You know, I think that it's a lot easier to deal with a bad dynamic when you're outside of it. So whatever pressure she felt in the relationship even though she may have jumped out of the fire and, in, or what is it, out of the frying pan and into the fire, um, at least she's out of the frying pan and she can see the, the frying pan and maybe she's feeling less angry at you um, and she's warming up a little bit. But another thing is that she's agreed to participate in a Bible study with an old friend long distance. Yeah, that's secondhand knowledge or something. Um, it's also long distance. It's an old friend. Maybe Maybe, you know, sometimes if she, if she has a pang of guilt or she wants to placate you, you said that you had a codependent two-way dynamic. That's the sort of thing she would say, you know, well, I'm looking, you know, when, 
I would guess you've probably said to her, but don't you realize this is morally wrong? And she'd be like, yeah, well, I'm, I'm going to a Bible study. I swear I'm going to do it. You know, I'm going to do that. That just sounds like that kind of thing. Believe it when you see it and don't even worry about what it is because what matters is what she actually does and what she's doing is staying with this other guy and not coming home. So this thing where you guys lost your faith, I just have so much compassion for you. Yeah, so that you kind of walked away from faith. And I think that's been happening for a lot of people, especially with the pandemic. And at the same time, she's not taking discernible, incredible actions to repair. So there you have it. She continues to live most of her life as though there's no thought of returning. There's your sign if you want to look for signs. She's not acting like somebody who's returning. And that's really significant. You can let go, Frank. You know what? You can let go. You can stop trying to make anything happen. And if she does have it in her that she wants to come back and work it out with you, she's a lot more likely to do it when that space is just a nice neutral field without you hanging there waiting for her like, are you coming back? Are you coming back? Because I can, I mean, it is like so clear. She was not able to be herself before. She was feeling pressured. She needs pressure off. Let her out. Just let her out. It won't do any harm. She's already gone. You know, for, as a human being, she and, and as your friend and as the mother of your kids, it just sounds like she's very lost right now. And she keeps saying the point of her doing this is I don't have a plan. I'm trying to figure it out. You said she had this hobby. She had homeschooled the kids. She didn't work. And that tells me she has no source of income. I don't know about this guy, but she doesn't have a way to get some space without a guy because she has no money. I'm guessing you guys had financial problems. She doesn't work. She, that's a terrible position for a person to be in. And, you know, we've seen other letters like this. In fact, I'll put one at the end of this where a family was breaking down kind of similar things. There was an infidelity. It kind of, you know, snowballed. In that case, the woman had a career. In this case, her not having a career in homeschooling kids, you know, I, if she was really young and everything just kind of happened, I just can really see this is what a lot of like my mom's generation went through, where there was this set of expectations from this culture you were in. You'd be the head of the household. She'd do the thing. No one ever asked what she said. She couldn't express what she wanted. She didn't know what she wanted. You know, I don't think it's good what she's doing, but I sure understand the need to just like get out and breathe and just be like, I don't know. I'm going to go create my own problems for a while and try to remember like, who am I? What am I here for? What am I trying to do? So I, I have compassion for her, even though this is a messy way to do it. Some of us, we don't know a better way to do it than to do it messy. Yeah, the stickers of the happy planning, and now she just doesn't want to plan. That is so poignant. With the homeschooling, the not working, and putting stickers on things as a grown woman, I, was, I, I don't know. It's sad to me. It's sad to me. It's pretty shallow. And um, I, I do agree that at raising kids and educating kids is total good, noble work. And it's important, but just for her as a person, for her to just feel like, I don't even know what to do with myself. She might need to get her heart broken out there. She might need to have some experiences outside of what's been prescribed for her all her life so that she can figure out who she is. And sadly, the cost of that might be your marriage. But I don't know, like you're feeling that everything was great. Here's something that really like caught my attention. It was just, you know, as I said, it, I, I noticed like these incredibly important details came out. You know, it's like, oh, she left, you know, she's just limerent. Oh, well, we had a threesome with the guy and we left the church right before that. And I'm like, whoa, wait a second. So you guys had a collapse of your worldview to do this stuff. And you believed we're in such a good place. It'll be great. I, I don't know. I'm hearing sort of a history of denial. And I, I understand, you know, you're a traumatized kid. We do that, but it's, but that's what's working against you here is you're not able to read a woman who's desperately unhappy. You're not able to read that the marriage is not in a good place. I love all the insight that you came up with about yourself. I think you've done an incredible job of that and you're probably right. It's probably too much, but I love how you've really worked to have insight about what you could have done differently. And so good on you, Whatever happens after this, you having insight and taking responsibility for your pattern and how that would have been hard for her and for you and for the family and for your situation. Yeah, you know, that's, that is noble work. That's a good job. I don't know what she's going to do. This whole thing where she's smoking, gaining a lot of weight, depressed, panic attacks, confused. It sounds like she's in a bad place and that you're, you're still like codependent. You're trying to fix your life by making her by trying to pretend that what's going on is limerence, that it's just some fantasy thing. She's gone, dude. She's gone. And um, that doesn't mean she won't come back, but there's, 
It's not, it's just like, this is, if she ever does, and I don't think it's very likely, if she ever does, it's got to be on her terms. You've got to let her have things on her terms. And how you do that is not by saying, I'm listening, I'm trying to listen to you, I'm trying to like get you to tell me how you feel. Like now is the time when you can just go, okay, well, if you want to talk, let me know. Like give her that space. And I know it's sad. I mean, this is terrible losing a wife and losing a wife when you have four kids. It's, it's, it's tragic, but you know what? You're in good company. I did it. Many here did it. And it turned out for the best. Like it ended up being okay. It's a really hard slog. I think the first year is hard. You're already halfway through it, Frank, you know, and you can do that. But then you said this other thing that was shocking to me. You go, I don't think he's that great. He's a porn addict too. It's like, wait a minute. So, and then you said they're two addicts together. So you calling her an addict, I don't know if you meant drugs, limerence, because she had this history of abusing prescription pills. Yeah, so I guess I didn't read this, but you had, she, when you first got married, she got super depressed, started taking all these prescription pills, had an affair, like the whole thing happened then. I don't know, I can't read her mind and she didn't write in, but it, if somebody does that right after getting married, I would just say, oh, hold on. <laughs> it sounds like they spiritually weren't really on board with their own decision for that. And that happens. That happens to young people. It happens to traumatized people. It happens to people who are raised in a super strong, you know, like belief system. Like it sounds like you two were where she, she went along with the program and then something in her was just like, stop, wait. And next thing you know, the kids. So yeah, you guys were collapsing from within for a long time. You have both been prescribed these roles. I'm the head of this. Everything's okay. And if, if you're copying that role as the like head of the family guy and then having financial struggles, I would imagine, and people do, lots of people have financial struggles, especially lately, but coupled with that, like I'm the head of the family, there's like a self-esteem wound right there. So then she's leaving. I don't know. I think you don't know who you are just as much as she doesn't. You guys feel young to me and that's good. You know, that's good. You're not like all used up and old and it's too late for you. It's not too late. Frank, I think it's time for you to work on your life. It's time for you to learn to let go, to change your pattern that you had from having an alcoholic mom of waiting and hoping and trying to be the good son. From time to time, I recommend this book, No More Mr. Nice Guy by Robert Glover. I love this book. It's really good for men who are trying to fix things by being nice so that the woman won't be mad. That's a toxic dynamic. Sometimes what you gotta do is stop worrying about how other people feel, including her, because she's gone, so you're not responsible now, and you just focus on making your life good. If you have a porn addiction, I'm just gonna suggest to you, Frank, you put that front and center. I'm glad you tested out CODA. I'm gonna suggest you go to Sex and Love Addicts Anonymous and deal with that porn addiction. Stop caring about whether the other guy, well, actually, I would be very upset if my kids were in custody where there was pornography around. I don't know, uh, some people feel like that's okay or that's contained, but I have a red flag up for both of you. It is a big deal. It's a big deal. It's um, not a good thing to have in the house with kids, certainly. I don't think it does any favors for marriages. And because you call it an addiction, it suggests that you can't stop. So, you know, there's a very unpopular view, but I, for one, you know, when I wrote down and got clear what I really needed in a, in a spouse, when I really was ready to turn my life around, that was one of the things. No pornography use. Now for all of you out there who are like, hey, it's no big deal, I like it, no big deal. Well, you do what you do or ask yourself, how's that working for you? But I had had enough experience trying to date men who did have that problem, who are way into it, and they just would totally dissociate. You know, they're not capable of intimacy. Um, it's a very understated problem. A lot of people don't wanna talk about, but I'm gonna talk about it. I would not date, date somebody who did that and so whether you end up with your wife or you know maybe one day you have a new relationship, be a stand-up guy who's totally emotionally available and cancel out this hemorrhage of your emotional energy. Like you really can live without it. Um, so Sex and Love Addicts Anonymous or SA Sex Addicts Anonymous, those are programs where men can go. I would suggest you go to a men only meeting and get the best sponsor in the room. So when you said you checked out Coder, I forget the word you used, um, I don't know, you went, you didn't say you worked the program. It's a 12 step program. And so you can sort of put your toe in and go, what is this thing by going to meetings and be acquainted with ideas. But as a 12 step veteran myself, I don't put any stock in anybody who doesn't work all 12 steps with a really good sponsor. 
visiting a program is not it. It's weird. I got this very angry email or not email, but a comment today from somebody who was trying to tell everybody that AA, I wouldn't recommend it to people who have been sexually abused or physically abused. And it's like, oh, like everybody who's drinking, that's very bad advice, by the way, person who said that. Very, very dangerous advice. There are a lot of people who are fragile and are finally, they're in a little bit of sobriety and that's all they need is somebody to BS them. When you're ready to get sober from your addiction, Frank, you will go to any lengths to get help for it. And I don't think that that help, the help for that kind of addiction is available like everywhere. Not all therapists know it. Um, I think some churches take it on, but being together with other men who are working on it themselves, there's no other substitute and it's free. You have money problems, you got four kids now, you got a thing on your hands. <laughs> so I'm gonna ask you to take that seriously and see if you can catch yourself. You know, if you wanna also go to CODA or Al-Anon too um, for that, whatever you need to do, you had the alcoholic mom, you know, I did 28 years in Al-Anon. I recommend it highly to start understanding the pattern, the difference, the energy that one gets. You know, you sound like an Al-Anon to me. And um, wherever you find there's really strong fellowship and you resonate. And ultimately the test of whether you're in the right 12-step fellowship is, are you able to help other people there? Are you able to sponsor them? Which would come in time. So yeah, I hear you kind of minimizing her drug use. I hear you minimizing your addiction. I hear you saying they're two addicts together. I, it sounds a little bit like three addicts to me. So you get sober. You get sober and you be the dad your kids need right now, regardless of what she does. And you know what? When you clear up your own problems, who knows? You might be a magnet for her. You might find you don't want to be with somebody who's that lost and not dealing with themselves. Or who knows? I'm not trying to take an opinion or judge her or say that I know what's going to happen. I can't read her mind and I can't read your mind. But from what you've told me, your life is crying for your attention right now. And that's what we do as kids of alcoholics who, who have this tendency. We will tend to have a hard time seeing our own issues or weighing how serious they are or solving them. We get very, very interested in what are they doing? You know, what's their problem? What are they doing? And then thinking that if you could get her to change, your life would be okay. And I'm sure that feels true. And there is some truth in it, but actually you're in a soul crisis of your life and your choices are falling apart. You can't remember who you are. You've fallen into all these behaviors and you've left behind your faith, which you can do if you want. You can go where you want to go. That book, No More Mr. Nice Guy, really emphasizes being friends with men and um, learning to start developing your own interests in life and not have that driven by the woman in your life all the time. And you know, I'm a woman I, and I, there's been times I sure wish my husband would just run his whole life by what I want, but that's not actually what I want. It's not attractive, it doesn't work for him and it doesn't work for me. I love that he has boundaries. I love that he does his own thing. So you can be like that too. About a year ago, I met a woman I'll call Angela. We entered into a relationship pretty quickly and it was very intense by my standards. We've been broken up now for several months and I'm still suffering. The relationship was only good for about three months, but I think I'm experiencing a trauma bond and the relationship has the markings of emotional abuse and perhaps narcissism, though I'm hesitant to label or diagnose and I hoped you could help. Before I met Angela, I had a feeling about the kind of relationship I wanted to have. I wanted a partnership with someone who wanted to grow together, and this was kind of new for me. In the past, I used to just approach relationships with a see how it goes attitude, but there was never a goal. And for the record, I'm a divorced father of two, and my past relationships, even though they didn't work out in the end, were pretty good. With Angela, I went into it knowing I wanted a lasting relationship, and she let me know pretty early that she was on board. There was a lot of synchronicity. It felt magical. We were texting all day, every day, having video chats and spending a lot of time together where we talk about the future. Within three months, we were talking about collaborations on business ventures and perhaps even moving in together in the near future. About this time, we went on a trip together and everything suddenly changed practically overnight. We had been at a big festival and I had to leave and go home and she stayed longer. Before I left, she said that she could feel herself withdrawing and something about sabotaging the relationship and that I would be more hurt than she would be. I asked her what she meant, if she meant we should break up or something, and she deflected and talked about plans to move in together in the future. After I got home, I got a call from her and she said she didn't want to be in a relationship anymore. She said she wasn't relationship material. I said, so we're breaking up then? 
And she said, whoa, stop thinking in such extreme terms. She said, that is linear thinking. She went away to her folks place for a while and I thought, well, we're not broken up yet. Let's just see what happens. Now this is where I get mad at myself. The whole dynamic went on through the summer where we weren't broken up, but we weren't in a relationship. Her communication at this time was cold, the total opposite of the first three months. I knew it wasn't healthy for me, but when I would start to pull away, she'd want me back. She called me from a cafe and blamed all of this on her avoidant attachment disorder. She said I was the love of her life and apologized and said she wanted to heal and grow together again. So then I'd take her back thinking, well, if she's aware of this attachment issue, maybe we can work with it. And then as soon as I'd get back into it, the cold communication started again. For example, when we were at the festival, she had uploaded a lot of photos that were taken of us together there. She put them on her Facebook page. It didn't really bother me, except that there was no communication with me about it. And then when she had that flip happen, when she turned cold again, she took all the photos down. Then later she'd put them all up again, still not communicating with me, and then take them down again. And through all of this, there was no communication. And I asked her at one point, why did she take the photos of me down? And she said, well, they gave the impression that we're in a relationship and we're not. Another time over the summer, those photos came up again, and she denied that she ever put them up and took them down again. The worst thing about all of this is the confusion. Yeah, that's just one example of back and forth, but it went on for months, and that's why I get angry at myself. I feel like I betrayed myself, and I enabled her. If she saw me pulling away again, she'd send me a playlist with love songs. She told me once that she was afraid I'd leave her, and so while she was away, she started a journal of her uninhibited thoughts and promised to send them to me or to give them to me when she got back into town. And of course, that never happened. She came back, but never spoke about the journal again. By this time, I felt like any attempt to communicate with her was going to just be confusing. I never knew who was going to show up. I told her I needed time alone, and I made that clear. The word breakup did come up. It was brought up by both of us, but first by me. She said, is that what's happening? And I nodded. I circle things that I want to come back to when I, I'm going to read the letter again, and we're going to come back and talk about parts of this. So she looked sad, and I asked for no contact and for her to just let me be, to let me be in my power, to let me be grounded, to not be confused, to connect with my soul again, to connect with the feeling I had before we met. The next morning, she sent me a selfie because she was starting a new job, and I texted her to say, you look good. They're lucky to have you, but please, no more contact. She waited two days and said, I'll wait for you to contact me. Then she sent a little sad face emoji and another and another. And within a couple more days, she just started flooding me with texts incessantly and trying to call using guilt. It was all about her. She said, I'm trembling inside. Please have some compassion. She wanted to meet to come get some kind of closure with me. When I didn't respond at all, her tactic went from guilt to anger and then rage. She started smearing me on Facebook. It may be going on still, but I, we've blocked each other. After a couple of months though, I sent her a letter explaining my timeline, how I understood what happened between us, that it seemed like she felt entitled to me and she didn't have to respond, but I wished her the best. She didn't respond for more than a week. And when she did, she said, I received your letter and I will answer it soon. I didn't expect anything, but maybe a month later she called and said, I'm just calling to tell you I will not be answering your letter. But the texts started again. Come on, we're friends. Show some compassion and be there for me. And my problem is I want so badly to answer her texts. It's like an alcoholic who wants to take a drink. If I text her, I'll be hooked again. I've come so far getting over her, but if I connect again, it'll be like starting from day one. What I really want is that feeling that I had before we met. I know how I want it to feel, and I've learned what to look out for. I was stronger in my boundaries in the beginning, and then it all got lost. But I'm getting stronger now. I'd love to meet someone really wonderful and live our lives together, but I haven't quite gotten free of the pull of this woman I know is out there. I can't get over it. I don't even know what to grieve. The woman I thought I loved, the relationship I thought we had, or the person I was before she met me. How can I heal and get free so that I can move on with my life and never get pulled down like that again? Martin. 
Oh. So this letter, it, this is a hard one. Just reading this, I feel my energy like sucked out of me. That's how this story affects me. And I think this might be something like what you're feeling, Martin, uh, and why you're having trouble disengaging from this, because it feels like you ought to be able to get your energy back. Like it got taken away from you, from this woman, and maybe you could somehow get it back. Let's go through what you wrote. About a year ago, I met a woman I'll call Angela. We entered into a relationship pretty quickly. All right, for people who have had trauma as a kid, and I know you had a separate story about that, which I didn't cover here. Going quick is one of the fastest ways to have a relationship that sort of brings up all of our stuff. And so if you've watched any of my videos, and I think you have, you know that I'm always advocating like slow it down, slow it down. But by the time I'm getting letters from people, they've, they're usually in something that brought up all the old stuff. And so here we are, and that's fine. So you got in quickly and it was very intense. And now you've been broken up for several months, but you're still suffering. The relationship was only good for about three months and you think you're experiencing a trauma bond. I think so too. <laughs> And the relationship has markings of emotional abuse. I think so too. And perhaps narcissistic traits. I think so too. I don't know if we would diagnose anyone here. We don't have to. We can just say that the traits are there. So before you met her, you had a feeling about the kind of relationship you wanted to have. So you were in touch with yourself. You say, I wanted a partnership with someone who wanted to grow together. And this was kind of new for me. In the past, I used to just approach relationships with a see how it goes attitude. So you used to just kind of cast it to the wind. And that's kind of a CPTSD thing too. The, the pattern that I notice in your letter is that in a lot of what you're going through, you have given away the power and your fate to another person. And a little bit, I could just hear there's, a, there's sort of a fog of denial that actually you're the one with agency. You're the one who decides. So you would see how it goes, but that sort of, in this case, knowing what I know from this letter, I would say you're waiting to see, like, how does the woman feel about it? So when you lose your power like that, it's an extremely vulnerable place. A lot of people say, oh, I attract narcissists. And I always say, well, it doesn't really matter who we attract. What matters is who we end up getting together with. And so for somebody who's very selfish and wants to use somebody to fill in some gap in their life, but not actually care about them as a person, which is kind of the story I'm hearing in this letter, that that's how she treated you. Well, that becomes possible when they find someone who's just going to sit around and wait and see what they do. And it doesn't really have a boundary or a set of standards for themselves. You have standards, but they got wobbly here around her. And I can only guess she must be very dazzling. I don't know, beautiful, talented, charming, fun. So a lot of great things happened there to sort of draw you in. But then you were, it's a foggy world where you have no defenses. That's the feeling I get about this relationship. Um, so you didn't have a goal in previous relationships. And for the rec you're a divorced father of two. Cool. Um, having kids puts extra uh, premium on having a a healthy relationship if you have one at all because it's so important for the kids right to model that for them so fantastic that you're not in this relationship anymore and that's not going to influence the kids any more than it may have already and that your past relationships have been pretty good even if they didn't work out but with Angela you went in knowing what you wanted she let you know she was on the same page she wanted a big future big you know long-term committed relationship that you would grow together sounds really good and then you got really enmeshed. You were texting all day, every day. That's, I mean, when people fall in love, they do that. When it has a sort of dark side to it, that's when we call it enmeshed. And so even the most pure love, when it doesn't have any oxygen from the outside world, when you're just completely into each other, texting all day, every day, video chats, talking about moving in together, getting together and always being about the future, that's really vulnerable. And so, Martin, I know that you're, you know, hoping to meet somebody great. And so just as I go through this one tip I'm going to give you here is when you are dating, be very careful about talking about the future. The future is something you could really, you know, I always suggest to people, like if you have a criteria, like I'm looking to get married, I have kids and you would be their step parent. Those are things that kind of need to be 
floated out there fairly early in the dating relationship, but talking about the future and trying to imagine it and construct it, especially if you have attachment wounds or trauma or one of your parents or both of them were very neglectful to you, it can be a really vulnerable thing. It can be prone to fantasy and limerence. So even though you're sitting with a real person right in front of you, you're interacting with a fantasy person. And I would say this person was interacting with some kind of fantasy of her own. I don't know her and she hasn't written in and she can't speak for herself here, but something's going on there. Um, some people call it future faking. You know, I want to move in with you. It turned out very quickly that wasn't at all where she was coming from. But that's one of the reasons why going slowly, because you know, just because we have CPTSD, we will often find ourselves kind of having a romantic involvement with someone who, um, who doesn't have those boundaries, who leaps into the future, who's not really capable of, of building a relationship and building commitment and uh, building a real true friendship where deciding to live together would happen at an organic time after you actually knew if you were compatible and wanted a future together. I think, you know, when you get to be north of 40 um, and younger, really, moving in together becomes, you know, you, you many of us have had the experience that it's, it's not easily undone. It's something to take extremely seriously. Some people just don't even do it. They either they get married or they live separately. It's a complicated kind of commitment. It's a, it's, it has a certain open-endedness to it. And yet your livelihood, your home, everything becomes like wrapped up in the relationship. And if you have that wound inside and you have that fear of abandonment going on, having your home wrapped up with an unreliable person and your money and your social circle and all that stuff. It's just too much to lose. And you could end up clinging to a bad relationship much longer than you should or losing it altogether because the person leaves you. Well, we can tolerate a certain amount of that in life, but if you've had a traumatic life, I really wish for you to have a slowly unfolding romance where maybe you date several people to see who the one is and then a slow unfoldment of one who turns out to be like a really good person for you to be with, which you could discover in certainly no less than a year, usually more like a year and a half, three years would be a normal healthy time to be dating somebody before you decide to stake everything on them. And especially because your kids, what's great about kids is you can think about what's good for the kids. What's good for the kids is good for you. So just as they, uh, it would not be good for them to have some partner of yours sort of come in and leave or a bunch of drama. It's not good for you either. So this is where the story gets, gets odd and hard for you about this time you went to a big festival and everything suddenly changed. It was like overnight, just boom. So you were going to move in together. Everything was so great. Then when you had to leave and she stayed and she said some weird thing about feeling like she was withdrawing and maybe it was over and you're just, you know, and then she denied when you said, are we broken up? She, she's just like, what are you talking about? No, we're moving in together. Very confusing. Very, you know, right there, the red flags are just starting to like, er, er, it's a red alert. Okay. After I got home, I got a call from her. She said she didn't want to be in the relationship anymore. She said she wasn't relationship material. Uh, by the way, when people say that, even though sometimes that's a cover for something else that they don't want to tell you, like perhaps what might be the case here is she met somebody else. Um, but it means they're not. When somebody wants to be with you, how you'll know is because they are with you because they don't want to risk losing you. Okay. And they, so they don't mess around with scaring you or saying they're not relationship material. They're going to put on their best behavior and try to impress you. So then you said, so we're breaking up. And she said, whoa, stop thinking in such extreme terms. And she said, I was linear thinking. Okay. This is hallmark. Everybody gets mad when I say this. There can be all kinds of ideological and spiritual abuse, but accusing you of linear thinking is a kind of ideological abuse or maybe spiritual abuse. Like, you know, when monogamy is expected and had been promised, <laughs> and you're accused of being too much in your head or thinking too linearly. It's like more red flags, red alert. You're not too linear of a thinker by asking, are we broken up when she says she doesn't want to be in a relationship with you? So this is just like all out gaslighting here and saying you're too linear, you're too extreme. And it sounds like I'm just going to read between the lines here. Well, I'll, I'll read about the next part here about the Facebook pictures. 
Then she went away to her folks and you thought, well, we're not broken up yet, so let's just see what happens. And I circled that, Martin, because you said that in the past you used to have this, let's just see how it goes, attitude and no goal. So what? So this is the point where you really surrendered your goal and you're just like, well, let's just see if she wants to, if she comes around and wants to be with you. And at this point, I think if you were stronger and more healed inside, you'd be going, F this person. They're just, they're being awful and inconsistent and blowing hot and cold and saying terrible things and accusing you of being too linear that you want to know if you're in a relationship or not. At that point, I think that would be, a, it's a pretty obvious time to break up with somebody, but you think, let's just see what happens. And, I, and maybe you mean, like, let's just see what your heart tells you. But how this story plays out, I just see you getting tossed around on this stormy sea of this other person and her whims for you. And that her whims for you have everything to do about what's convenient for her and never anything to do with how you might feel. And I'm guessing that there was a precedent for that in your childhood, that people did not take seriously what you needed and things were all about them. All right, so then you said, this is where you get mad at yourself. Good, healthy, healthy anger. <laughs> the whole dynamic went on through the summer where you weren't broken up, but you weren't together. How convenient for her, right? Her communication at this time was cold, the total opposite of the first three months. I knew it wasn't healthy for me, but when when I would start to pull away, she'd want me back. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> yep, yeah. she wanted you not here, not gone. She wanted you right about here. You know, probably for not evil reasons, but that's just kind of where she wanted you and she knew that wouldn't work for you. And so, you know, she just kept saying, she just fed you what you wanted to hear so that you would stick around. It's nice to have somebody kind of waiting in the wings for you. It sounds very much though, like she wanted to appear single for, for one or more other people and just keep you kind of as a backup insurance policy. And that's very harsh to say, but that is that is definitely what I'm sort of detecting here. All right. You knew it wasn't healthy for you. No, it wasn't. <laughs> but when you pull away, she'd do it again, just pull you back in. And she called you from a cafe and she blamed all of this on her avoidant attachment disorder. You know, maybe that there's certainly signs of that, but it sounds like it's something even worse. Um, and I'm not a therapist <laughs> or a clinician of any kind, but what I know about avoidant attachment disorder is, it, you know, it's, it's all about avoidance. So this like, you know, getting all enmeshed and pulling together, that suggests that there's something else going on. So she said you were the love of her life and she apologized and she said she wanted to heal and grow together. Those are like the magic words for you, right? I want to heal and grow together because that was your ideal and she knew that. And so that you'd, you'd take her back and you did. And you were thinking, well, now if she's aware she has this issue, maybe we can work with it. And I totally get it. You know, I was um, in a relationship with a guy who had a terrible drug addiction and he said, I'm so sorry, I'm going to go to treatment. And he got into treatment and I thought, see, so as long as he's actually in treatment, there's hope for us. But the, like, just, to, you know, obviously our two cases are very different. But in that case, when I look back, I just say, even if he was utterly sincere, which he wasn't, he was doing it just so I wouldn't leave. Even if he had been utterly sincere, it's a long road for somebody who's that dysfunctional to actually heal enough to become a person who would be good to be in a relationship with, whether it's drugs or whether it's this just like crazy back and forth deception and um, inconsideration and selfishness. So let's just say it's not like some kind of a personality disorder or anything. It's the facts. This is how she acts. And I just wouldn't recommend to anybody and I don't want for you, you're just like a dear person. You want love. I just don't wish this on you at all for somebody to treat you like that. But I get it how the trauma bonding, as you mentioned, for anybody watching trauma bonding is, it's like a psychological phenomenon. It could happen to anybody, not just traumatized people where when somebody's like, I love you, I love you, I love you. And then they're like, I'm not talking to you. And then I love you, I love you, I love you. And then I'm not talking to you. It, it like hooks something in our brains. It just gets us hooked in. It gets us obsessed with when I'm going to get the next, you know, cookie of affection, of, of acknowledgement, of touch, of talking and contact. It can make a person obsessed. It can make a person addicted. Okay. Okay. So then you give us the example of the cold communication, which is that when you were at the festival, she put a bunch of pictures of you guys up on Facebook without asking you. And I'd say in a new relationship, 
yeah, you're supposed to ask. <laughs> it's a very public thing to do. And especially if you tag them, you know, it goes on their page and it's like announcing like, hey, I'm the girlfriend of this guy. So, you know, what some people might call a pissing match. And, um, and you, but you, it didn't bother you. You, you were okay to be public, except it was weird that she didn't talk to you. Correct. Then when her whole personality flipped, when she turned cold again, she took all the photos down. Then she put them back up there again and then take them down again. And through all of this, there was no communication. You asked her at one point why she did it. And she said, well, they gave the impression that we were in a relationship and we're not. Okay. So Martin, this is the like hardest tough love moment of this. Why would somebody at a festival take pictures down? It's so that they can appear available to somebody else. I am getting a strong sense there was somebody else or many people. I doubt it was like the love of her life or anything worked out great because she's very erratic with this stuff. But putting you up there without talking to you is, you know, lots of people do it. It's normal. But that thing where she doesn't talk to you and throws it up there and wants to create an impression, it's all about how other people see her. That's what it's, that's what I'm saying. How you feel about having the pictures put up, how you feel about having them taken down, don't matter to her. They would matter to anybody, both things, putting them up, taking them down. It, it speaks a lot and anybody would have feelings about that, that she doesn't care and that she later denied that she ever put them up and down. Okay, <laughs> that's, uh, that's BS, okay? That's not cool. Um, that's a utter self-centeredness. And she seems to be completely driven about how other people see her and doesn't want to appear to be in a relationship. And there's only one reason why people do that. Okay. The worst of it, you say, is the confusion. That was just one example of the sort of back and forth and back and forth of hot and cold. It went on for months. And that's why you get angry at yourself, which I understand. You feel like you betrayed yourself. And I understand, I mean, yes, but I understand how that happened. You know, it could happen to any of us, really. It has. And you enabled her. Um, I guess so. Yeah, you could call it that. If she saw you pulling away again, she'd send you a playlist with love songs. She told you once she was afraid that she'd get left. And so while she was away, she started a journal of all her uninhibited thoughts. I'm guessing that's some sort of sexy thing and promised to send it to you or give it to you when she got back into town. Man, what a manipulative hook. Basically, like if somebody was an alchemist and tried to take a man's brain and just put a giant gaffing hook in it and go, just yank it, but then just throw it aside, I'd say that's how to do it, you know? That would be how to do it. So it never happened. She came back. It was never spoken about again. But this time, you felt like any attempt to communicate with her was going to be confusing, and you were right, Martin. <laughs> You never knew who was going to show up. And so that's interesting. Yeah, just like a totally unstable personality there. I'm sure not going to be surprised if she was traumatized too. But just because we're traumatized doesn't give us the right to trample all over other people. It may give us difficulty in relationships. It may cause our personalities to go out of control. I know lots of people struggle with mental illness, but that still doesn't make it okay to abuse people emotionally. Everything that you suspected here, narcissistic traits, emotional abuse, and trauma bond, I think you're right. I think your perception is accurate, and I just want to validate that. Sometimes sometimes just having that validated by someone who gets it is enough to just help you go, okay, <laughs> Ugh. you know, and wash that person out of your hair. <laughs> I love that song. I'm going to wash that man right out of my hair. And that's, that's, there's a time for that, isn't there? So get ready. Get that shower warming up, Martin. It's time. It's, it's coming time. Let's read the rest of the letter. Okay. I told her I needed time alone, and I made that clear. Clear. I'm going to circle because what I think is part of the part that you might be able to adjust about this for your next relationship is your concept of what is clear and what is not clear. You say the word breakup did come up. It was brought up by both of us, but first by me. It's weird how you use a sort of passive verb on that. The word was brought up. It's like, I, you don't say, I broke up with her. I made it clear that I was breaking up with her. That's not what you say. You say, I needed time alone, and the word came up. Like it had a life of its own, and it came in, and it flew out of my mouth. It flew out of her mouth. I'm not really sure what to make of it, but... She said, is that what's happening? And you nodded. Okay, nodding instead of going... 
yes, Angela, it's over, babe. That's it. <laughs> you know, that's, that would be clear, but I nodded. That's ambiguous. All right. And I get it. But this, I just, you know, the picture I have of this and the way that I feel drained reading the letter, I just think you are dealing with a vampire. And yeah, even coming close to the story, it's very draining. She, she looked sad when you nodded and, a, and when you asked for no contact, you asked, not told. When you want no contact, you don't ask for it, you declare it. All right. That's, I'm just, I'm just telling you here. I'm, I'm hearing the passivity in what you're doing here. And I think that's what it is. That spell that this whole relationship has cast over you. It's like drained your power to the point that you're like, please, can, can you just give me no contact and not, just pulling down the wall yourself. And then you asked for her to let you be, to let you be in your power. So if it's your power, nobody has to let you be in it. Your power is your power and you, you generate that power. You hold that power regardless of what she wants or allows, right? And you wanted to be allowed, she said, you asked her to let you be grounded. You asked her so that you could not be confused. You wanted to connect with your soul again and connect with the feeling that you had before you met. And so here, there's just like this crucial, you know, mind F here, where you, it got you believing that she had to give that to you, that she held all the power. And because you fell into that false belief, it actually became a true situation. She had all that power over you. Not that she could do anything with it. She, she sounds very unwell. But the next morning she sent you a selfie. <laughs> so you said no contact. So she sends you a picture the next day because she was starting a new job. So you had said no contact, but did you have no contact? No, you typed back and said she looked good. Oh, you made her feel good about herself. And you said they're lucky to have you. But you know, actually, I don't think they are. Based on how she treated you, I think that it's very unlikely that that's gonna go very well <laughs> for people. So you, but you gave her the compliment and I just, you know, that's a clue sometimes when somebody is emotionally abusive to you and you're like, you look good, honey. They're so lucky to have you. Like in what dynamic do we do that, right? The dynamic would be more like narcissist and codependent. Again, can't diagnose anybody, but that's the dynamic that that looks like. Then you say, please, no more contact. So again, please, like you're begging her for no contact. And you know, if you really, if you're serious about no contact, you can do it. You block the person. And if it comes to it, you can get a restraining order. And I don't think that would be totally out of line here because, because of what she ended up doing. Okay. And, and then that's where you tell us about this. She waited about two days after you said no contact. So no respect here. And then she said, I'll wait for you to contact me. Uh, you know, I could just see her calculating. What can I say to break contact and try to hook him in again? Okay, I'll wait for you to contact me. Uh, okay, but you said no contact. Then she sent little sad face emoji and another and another. So she's just sitting there. It's like a, like with a fishing pole, just casting out with her hook. Come on, Martin, come on, come on, come back to me. <laughs> but with a hook, you know, just like, ha ha. Not love. There's nothing here that's love. You know that, right? This is not love. This is consumption. Then she started flooding you with texts incessantly, trying to call, trying to call you on the phone using guilt. It was all about her. Yeah. She said, I'm trembling inside. Please have some compassion. So she's trying every tactic in the book. Oh, poor me. It's going to break me. She, she wanted to meet and come and have some sort of closure. Okay. Big red flag word for anybody who's watched my videos, that word closure in the context of a breakup closure. Sure. If you had a serious relationship, let's say you were married and suddenly the person leaves or you were engaged, you know, like in a serious committed relationship that suddenly ends and one person never knew why, then having that conversation eventually would be closure. But in this one, you don't need closure. There's no closure. Closure is almost always a code word for the opposite of closure. I just want to get together and talk so we can have some closure means. I just want to get together and talk so I can hook you in again, get that emotional ball rolling again, right? So you say, when I didn't respond at all, her tactic went from guilt to anger and then rage. I'm not surprised because she's trying, she's just trying the full like spectrum of tactics to hook you in. She started smearing you on Facebook. Okay. This is where it goes from, I can't tell whether 
you know, it's emotional abuse because I wasn't there, but smearing people on Facebook, yes, that is abuse. And it may be going on still, except you've blocked her. Good job. After a couple months, though, I sent her a letter, you say, explaining my timeline. Okay, oops, so you had a relapse. That's what that is. And I know that your mind is thinking, okay, it was a couple months, and but I, I'm just going to say, Martin, what were you thinking would happen if you explained your timeline? Like, what possible good could come from reaching out to an abusive, unstable person so that they know your timeline? Like, oh, now I know your timeline and what you believe happened. And then what happens? They they say, oh, I'm so sorry. I Yeah, I was a jerk. I wish, you know, or oh, I'm coming back to you. I realize I love you. You mentioned this. There's parts of the letter I didn't include. We had a very long exchange on it. But you know this is addiction, and that's addiction can sort of grab hold of your mind and make you think like, okay, it's been two months. I can do it now. Like it's safe for me to have contact now, just like an alcoholic will go, okay, I didn't drink for two months. Now I can drink. It'll just be one. It'll be fine. You said she, she, it seemed like she felt entitled to you. You're right. You have very good perception about this. It's just that some part of your brain gets hijacked and just keeps thinking that somehow you can make it change if you just say it and do the right thing. And um, so, you know, so the rest of her here just to go, oh yeah, we've done that too and it never works. Okay. And you said she didn't have to respond, but you know what is going to happen. You said you wished her the best and she didn't respond for more than a week. Oh, I like that tactic too. Like let there be a little bit of worry that she's not going to, that you're not going to get back. You know, that's how you sort of build suspense, suspense in, in a trauma bond. You can never just get back to somebody. You have to delay it so that they just get all like wound up waiting for that. So that when they do get a lousy text from you, they're just like, ah, I got a text. That's how trauma bonding works. It always has to be interspersed with neglect and abandonment and just coldness. And then, ooh, you know, love bomb, right? When she did respond, she said, this is just to tell you I'll answer it soon, okay? Then you say you didn't expect anything, but I'm gonna say you did or you would never have written her. Um, and then maybe a month later, she called and she said, I'm just calling you to tell you I won't be answering your letter. Well, when you're not gonna answer somebody's letter, you don't call them. That was a hook. That was another one. <laughs> And I love that. It's like all dressed up as like, you know, I've got boundaries, right? But it's not boundaries. It's, it's a hook and it's a break of contact. But that's okay. We all do it. <laughs> We're all just trudging along here trying to figure out how do we love? How do we live life, right? So you're just like everyone here and you're, you're good. All right. But the text started again. So here come the texts from her and she starts saying, come on, we're friends. Show some compassion. Be there for me. Okay, more of her tactics. So then you say, Martin, my problem is I want so badly to answer the texts. It's like, yep, that's what they were designed to do. And it's like an alcoholic who wants to take a drink. If I text her, I'll be hooked again. And I've come so far getting over her. But if I connect again, it'll be like starting from day one. So one thing that alcoholics do when they're in early sobriety is they don't go around people drinking. And they um, sometimes live in sober living houses and they they set themselves up to eliminate the trigger and the trigger for you is contact with her it would also be thinking about her fantasizing that it could have been okay and so this is i would i would class this as a form of limerence with somebody you actually did have a relationship with but you're having um a romance with the idea with that incredible experience you had in the first three months and even though it went totally to hell you're still like in love with that her and with that you and with that couple and that possibility that you once had there. And so the process of healing is going to involve just facing that and seeing it for what it was, that that, that was the hope of what it was, but time did allow you to see what the reality of that relationship is. And a lot of what, you know, you can learn a lot about relationships. We, we, we're so good at compartmentalizing things because of that crap fit thing from growing up being very good at sort of compartmentalizing. It's like, I know that, you know, mom and dad hit each other, but we're also a very nice family and I can show that to the world. We get so good at compartmentalizing abusive behavior from this other part of life that it seems normal to you or possible to you that the person who treats you like this could actually be this, you know, wonderful relationship. And so it keeps your heart engaged with it. And it's very painful to face, to face reality and say, this is a very disturbed and unstable person. 
and uh, we don't know I don't know exactly what's wrong with her but I know how she treats you and it's unacceptable and it's definitely nothing that would ever turn into a happy relationship and so one gut check and reality check is well what does it feel like to be with this person well what did it feel like to be with that person well that is how it feels to be with that person it feels like it just does not feel good it makes you feel bad it makes you angry you turned it on yourself like you're angry at yourself for putting up with it but I think as time goes by your anger will quite rightly be directed outward at the person who mistreated you so it's interesting you say what I really want is that feeling that I had before we met so you know I think sometimes people come into our lives like a tornado and they just come in and they wreck the whole trailer park and we can remember how it was before that happened but really what we're going to do now is take what we learned and move forward because the one silver lining of a terrible relationship or anything bad that happens to us I wouldn't wish it on anyone but when it's happened you can begin to see what are your tender spots where is your unhealed trauma what is your vulnerability to abuse so it points you to where you can begin to heal and work on that now you know I teach these techniques the daily practice to start unpacking and and releasing the fearful and resentful thoughts and beliefs about yourself and the world that would have you you know impulsively following decisions in your life that are more driven by trauma than by what you really want or what's good for you or what is going to bring love into your life of course we want love in your life you absolutely deserve to have a good loving person who appreciates you for who you are so this happened wash it out of your hair and I really encourage you to get extremely active and structured in your approach to healing from the trauma that would allow this to happen to you if it happens once it kind of increase the, increases the odds that it's going to happen again especially afterwards it's weird how it works like that it's, it's almost like it forms a magnetic groove in you and you very easily can fall right into the same thing or you could change the pattern but a lot of times that takes a conscious effort to change that pattern so it's conscious effort time and you you know you got in touch with me which is so brave and and is I do hope very much that what I'm saying to you can help you can help you believe in yourself enough to take action I'm going to also recommend you have no contact at all even if it requires a restraining order with this person this is just flat out toxic so you had said I don't know what to grieve the woman you thought you loved the relationship you thought you had or the person you were before you met you get to grieve that is what heartbreak is and the good news is what feels like it's about the other person is usually more about the ideal that we had and the ideal has with that person has been lost but it's been revealed for what it is and the beautiful relationship that you crave still lies ahead of you and all you need to do to become ready for it is to heal I know easier said than done but that's what this channel is all about 